at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 12 o'clock on Thursday, the 28th of uh, March. There we go. Breaking. A 19-year-old man has now been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a man was stabbed on a train between Beckingham Junction and Shortlands Railway Stations in South London on Wednesday. Rainer Tax Dodge. Angela Rayner refuses again to publish her tax history, insisting the public should believe her when she says she's done nothing wrong. Despite this, the police are now looking again at the sale of one of her houses. And King Charles has spoken of his great sadness at missing the traditional Monday Thursday service due to his cancer treatment. Queen Camilla has been pictured alone at Worcester Cathedral. Now, a suspect has been caught in the shocking case of uh, a knife attack in broad daylight on an overground service in London. Yes, and only hours later, we heard of two more uh, victims of knife crime, this time at Kennington Station, again in South London, more centrally. Shocking. Shocking. Mm. We're going to be asking the question, have the police lost control of our streets. It seems as though, not just in the capital, but across the country, we're seeing more violent attacks, more stabbings, mm. more sexual assaults. And we're asking, why is this happening and what can be done to stop it? Who do you blame for this? Is it the police's fault? Are they doing a tough job? What is mm. going on? We'll also get the inside scoop on that manhunt. It lasted for less than 24 hours, and it seems that a suspect has, in the last few minutes, been arrested. So developing news on that front, which we'll bring you throughout the programme. But much to discuss here, and we want your views on it all. GBviews at gbnews.com. Has London got less safe? And frankly, what can be done about it? But all that to come after your headlines. Very good afternoon to you. It's two minutes past 12. I am Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom, and we begin with some breaking news. A 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after an alleged stabbing on a London train yesterday afternoon. A graphic footage shared on social media showed a masked man allegedly attacking another with a large knife. Uh, while concerned passengers looked on, they can be heard calling for help. It's thought to have happened between 4 p around 4pm between Shortlands and Beckenham uh, Junction on a train bound for Victoria Station. The victim remains in life-threatening condition in hospital. Former Met Police Detective Peter Blexley says incidents like this have become the norm for emergency services. It's a terrifying experience for anybody who's unfortunate enough to be on that train, I'm sure. But, of course, not out of the ordinary for the 999 responders the paramedics and the police who will have attended this dreadful incident because this is the kind of thing they witness and see the results of only too often, I'm afraid, in Great Britain in 2024. The Chancellor says he believes Thames water is solvent despite shareholders withholding extra cash to keep it afloat. Half a billion pounds was to be invested before the end of the month, 
But shareholders say the business plan is uninvestable. They want the regulator off what to increase customer bills by up to 40% over a five-year period. The company serves nearly a quarter of the UK's population and has debts of more than £15, million, £15 billion. It comes as rowers taking part in the boat race this weekend were warned of high levels of E. coli in the River Thames as a result of the company dumping raw sewage. Uh, the Chancellor has promised to hold the company to account. Treasury will continue to monitor very carefully what's happening at Thames Water. Our understanding is that the company is still solvent and today's news should not have an impact on the services received by customers. Obviously, um, there are parts of the country where the service has not been up to scratch, including in my own constituency, and local MPs will continue to hold Thames Water to account in those situations. But overall, we will continue to watch the situation very carefully. Last year's recession was less severe than initially thought, according to revised figures. The Office for National Statistics has found the economy did still shrink for two quarters in a row, but the total contraction over that six-month period had dropped from 0.5% to 0.1%. The government says that is proof their plan's working. Well, the Labour leader says Britain wants change. He has outlined his party's election campaign. Speaking at an event in the West Midlands, Sir Keir Starmer pledged a national renewal promising to axe zero-hour contracts and give powers to local mayors to rejuvenate the high street. Stability with Labour or more chaos with the Tories? Unity or division? Renewal or decline? A changed Labour Party ready to serve the interests of working people? Or a Conservative Party that has forgotten how to serve anything other than itself? The Archbishop of Canterbury has called on people to pray this Easter weekend for the jailed journalist Evan Gerskowitz. A good Friday marks a year since the Wall Street Journal reporter was detained in Russia on charges of spying. Uh, no evidence has been presented for the allegations. He's the first US journalist to be arrested in Russia since the Cold War. Justin Welby says journalists around the world should be protected and free to hold those in power to account. Millions of people are being urged to send meter readings to their energy supplier this weekend to ensure they don't overpay. The average household energy bill is to fall to its lowest point in two years from next month after Ofgem lowered its price cap. It will drop 12.3% from next Monday, lowering average annual bills from £1,900 to £1,700. It's an average saving of about £20 every month. And if you're planning on travelling this Easter weekend, well, you might want to set your alarm clock early or rethink those plans. The RAC is warning of long delays with journeys on some of the most popular routes estimated to take twice as long as normal. With the bank holiday weekend coinciding with the Easter holidays, some 14 million journeys have been predicted over the coming days. And much of the congestion is expected to start this evening. Drivers advise to consider travelling off peak times. Well, for the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Emily and Tom. Good afternoon, Britain. It is seven minutes past 12 and some breaking news in the last few minutes. A 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a man was stabbed on a train between Beckenham Junction and Shortlands railway stations in South London yesterday. Well, let's cross to Shortlands station and speak to our reporter, Ray Addison. We're just receiving this news in the last few minutes. What do we know? Well, police are saying that a knife was recovered as well following uh, this arrest. A 19-year-old man on suspicion of attempted murder. They've confirmed as well that the uh, other man that was involved in this incident uh, remains in hospital in a critical but stable condition. They've confirmed that he was in his 20s and they say that his family is now being supported by specialist officers. Now, we know that uh, this 
incident uh, began uh, here at Shortlands Station. Police receiving a call shortly before 4 p.m. yesterday afternoon. They'd heard reports that two men uh, had been fighting as they were boarding a train here at Shortlands. And then, of course, we saw that dramatic, shocking footage of an incident on board the train heading towards Beckenham Junction. Now, that man uh, has now been arrested, 19 years old, and obviously on suspicion of attempted murder. And the British Transport Police Superintendent Darren Malpas saying in a statement, we understand the concerns of the public following this incident, and our detectives have been working tirelessly to investigate. I hope this arrest will bring some reassurance to those on the rail network. And obviously, I've been speaking to, to people here, commuters who use this station uh, every single day. Uh, on their journey, and they were telling me how deeply concerned not only this incident but other recent incidents uh, on the rail network uh, have made them about travelling, uh, uh, obviously concerns for their safety, some saying that perhaps uh, there needs to be um, officers on board trains or some kind of security on board uh, trains as well to help protect members of the public. But, of course, we're limited to what we can say at this time, but this arrest now has been made of this 19-year-old man. And, Ray, um, tell us a little bit about Bromley. It's not usually um, considered a particularly dangerous area of London, is it? Well, it's really interesting, Emily, because we've had uh, people coming up to us uh, throughout the day um, very, very angry. In fact, one GB News viewer uh, drove here specifically to come and see me and, uh, and express his frustration at the um, uh, types of crimes and incidents that they have seen in recent years. And I'm not just talking about one person or two people. Multiple people have come up to us today and say that they've lived here their whole life and they have seen a, a dramatic increase, they say, in violence. And, of course, um, that often then goes on to the rail network, which people use every day for their, for their work or their leisure. And they're very, very concerned. They say that this area has changed completely in recent years. They're very angry about it. And they are keen to see some kind of action taken to help protect members of the public. No, it is absolutely shocking. And again, we're not showing that video due to this arrest. There are now restrictions around what we can see and what we can show and what we can say. But really, really uh, gruesome story here and developing, of course. Ray Edison, thank you very much for uh, reporting live there on the ground. Very interesting to get that context about the area that in mm. recent years there's been a decline in how people feel in terms of their own safety. I'm sure that's a story that other people have from other areas of the country. Yes, well, we're going to move across to Kennington now, where hours after this incident, police were called to Kennington Tube Station. This is a Zone 1 slash 2 station uh, in, in South London, as two people were stabbed on a platform there in this uh, attack that's been described as senseless. Well, our Home and Security editor joins us from Kennington now. Um, Mark, what do we know about this incident? Well, this incident unfolded around about half past ten last night. It was on the northbound platform of uh, the Northern Line service here at Kennington Tube Station. Uh, a passenger there waiting to board a train was stabbed by a man and critically injured. Then we're told by police that another commuter who was on the platform at the time bravely tried to interject to help this man who was being stabbed and was stabbed himself. I think it goes some way to uh, maybe answering some of those who've been uh, asking questions and perhaps criticising individuals on that train in Beckingham uh, as to why uh, people didn't intervene uh, to help out the man who was being stabbed. It is, of course, very brave to do so but it carries significant dangers, as this commuter found out. Both these men were taken to a major trauma centre in central London. They are described as being in a critical but stable condition. The attacker fled the scene here at Kennington just before the emergency services arrived in this area. So there is now a manhunt <laughs> underway to try to 
establish who this attacker is, mm -hmm. uh, to bring them uh, to justice. The police are still here in numbers. We've had forensic teams here as well, examining the scene on the platform, looking at CCTV, both at the station and surrounding area. And of course, speaking to witnesses who were there on the station and saw this terrible incident unfold. For all of the criticism that the Metropolitan Police come in for, it does seem that with the Shortlands affair, there was a fairly short, rapid manhunt. Someone has now been arrested, a suspect has been arrested. Uh, presumably, uh, it will be a very similar case here in Kennington, and the teams are only a few hours behind the teams that were uh, investigating the, uh, the Shortlands affair. Well, you'd have to hope anyway that that might be uh, the way that this progresses, we get a similar outcome. Uh, what we need to always remind people of is, although there has been an arrest, it doesn't necessarily mean that that is their prime suspect in custody. We will wait to hear what British Transport Police say about that. You will often find that individuals are arrested um, because they may be connected uh, to a potential suspect or they answer a general description. So in the fullness of time, we'll know how significant the arrest has been that has just come out in the last few minutes. But in the meantime, as you say, Tom, quite rightly, mm. the manhunt <clears throat> continues for the attacker here. And British Transport Police and Metropolitan Police Forces right across the country, in fact, have a significant issue in dealing with the violent crime problem involving knives and guns that is not just confined to the streets because these people, these violent offenders who carry these weapons, uh, use a transport system like everybody else. They take buses and are on trains uh, and tube trains as well. And at times that violence erupts while they're on a train or indeed on a platform. It is a big issue uh, that the police are dealing with because one of the other issues they find is that the rail network and tube network in particular is used uh, by drug dealers uh, for their likes of the county lines issue. And these are people that are armed with uh, often uh, knives and other weapons uh, on the transport network, taking drug supplies from one area uh, of the country to another. And that just adds to the risk for ordinary members of the public out and about using the public transport system and increasingly concerned mm. about just how violent these modes of transport are becoming. And Mark, just lastly, the London Mayor Sadiq Khan said recently that London is the safest global city. Is that still the case? London has a, a significant violent crime problem, there is no doubt about that, particularly when it comes to the uh, younger uh, uh, element within uh, society here in London. Uh, there is a knife crime problem, there is a gun problem. Uh, and the police are battling constantly to try to get on top of that. Uh, they're dealing with finite resources. There was, you'll remember, just weeks ago, quite a lot of uh, anger expressed that uh, the mayor managed to find £6.3 million to rebrand overground rail networks uh, at a time when the Metropolitan Police, for instance, is trying to secure more money from the mayor's office uh, for their safer neighbourhood uh, schemes to help keep London safe. Mark White, thank you very much for bringing us the very latest from Kennington Station in South London. Really concerning stories developing now. Two manhunts, one arrest, three separate stab victims in two separate attacks. Let's get some more on this with the former head of counterterrorism for the City of London Police, Kevin Hurley. Now, Kevin, uh, we can't go into too much detail on the specifics of the arrest. There are, of course, restrictions around that. But in the general terms, what we've seen in these two separate attacks that took place yesterday, does this show that there is a sense of law and order in our capital city breaking down? Well, let me just, uh, before I answer it, say that I was the head of Operation Blunt 2 uh, during 2008, where we had 28 youth murders, and four years later we got it down to eight youth murders. So I do know a little bit about 
the strategy needed to be followed to stop youth murder on the street, if you like. Um, to, to answer your question, this is just part of normal life in London and our major cities, and we'll go on for a long time with no change and will get gradually worse. And the principal reason behind it is that the policing methods that were once used to create a deterrent from people carrying knives, which was essentially stop and search on groups known to carry knives and do the attacks, has been much reduced. The bottom line is people know that they can pretty much carry a knife or a weapon on the streets of London with relative impunity from being detected. And of course, if that happens and people then get in altercations and arguments, then they will turn to the knife um, without thinking the consequences of using that knife on someone, because a knife has a devastating effect on the body if it hits you. Kevin, I grew up in London and I don't remember it ever being this bad in terms of the breakdown in, in trust, trust between, between uh, citizens. citizens. Oh, well, oh, I, I have double 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 I mean, I, I personally love it when there are more than one of you. That, um, that is a, a treat. But uh, we do there seem to have a connection well. issue that was the uh, um, But what I was uh, saying that, was that but... um, <clears throat> I don't ever remember such a breakdown in trust between citizens and the general public feeling unsafe. I don't want to be hyperbolic about this because I don't think that's very sensible. Mm. But it is clearly the case that whether it's police priorities being wrong or just the breakdown in terms of social fabric or something deeper, mm. um, people do are more fearful no, I think... going about their daily lives because of this sort of thing. And, of course, it gets amplified with social media and everything, but... <sighs> I couldn't count the number of times that we've reported on it. Other uh, colleagues of ours have reported on just stabbing after stabbing in our capital city, uh, particularly over the last two years. It seems that there has been a significant uptick in violent crime, and there are many, many different causes for this, chiefly, perhaps, this issue that we keep coming back to, the county lines gangs issue. Mm. And the big question, are we stopping and searching enough people? Exactly. There are so many, many different issues here that all feed into this pervasive sense of lawlessness. It's interesting because a lot of people, you know, come out absolutely horrified when something like this happens, but are ideolo ideologically against things like stop and search, mm. which I believe have been proven to work if done correctly. Yes. And I think we're getting to some kind of scenario where you're going to have to try more of this, these sorts of things. And if, you know... You... <sighs> I don't know, it's, it's difficult for the police. Of it course is it is. They're the police will be called acting. every yeah. name under the sun and it must be soul-destroying. But when you know that there are certain areas of London, when you know that there are certain gangs, when there are known individuals to the police who keep popping up in instances like this, frankly, what other choice do you have than to stop and search people you suspect of carrying dangerous weapons? But what we do know is there are far too many young men carrying knives and then using them. But uh, coming up, Angela Rayner says the public should believe her when she says she has done nothing wrong. But the police are now looking again at the sale of one of her houses. Should she release her tax affairs? Good afternoon, Britain, on GP News. GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here, or is it more about the toothbrush? Because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night, you're gonna be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. 
You're exactly right. Yeah, there is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over scrub and over brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning, as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Right, well, we are going to be bringing you some pictures of Queen Camilla, who has been at service at Worcester Cathedral, <laughs> shaking hands with members of the public, I believe. Indeed, and this is, of course, the uh, Maundy Thursday service that happens every year. The King could not attend this year due to his treatment, ongoing treatment after that cancer diagnosis. So the Queen there representing not just herself, but the wider royal family too at this service that uh, the King had sent his apologies for and it seemed he was uh, sad to miss. She really has proven herself to be particularly stoic in the mm. face of everything that's going on health-wise within the royal family with Princess Catherine unwell, with, of course, her husband, King Charles, unwell mm. too. And uh, this is her after the religious service at Worcester Cathedral today. Mm. Meeting and greeting, doing her duties, going about everything as normal, but as Tom says, representing the royal family. Yes, and this is, of course, a slimmed down senior royal family, far slimmer than the original plans for a slim down royal family. Two senior royals out of action, both undergoing treatment for cancer. Uh, and it is actually quite interesting to see how both Camilla and William have stepped up and really been, been carrying out far more uh, duties and, and, and far larger of a role than they had previously done and than they had thought that they would be doing. And I wonder if it has brought Camilla and William closer together, these two people who now seem to be spearheading the royal family in all that they do. And it's an absolutely beautiful cathedral, Worcester Cathedral. Have yes. you ever been there? I haven't, actually. It's, it's stunningly, stunningly beautiful. And King Charles has, because he can't be there today, um, he has released a special video message ahead of the service uh, this morning. Um, I believe we're going to speak to Cameron Walker, our royal correspondent, who is standing by for us. Um, Cameron, we were just uh, looking at those uh, pictures there of Queen Camilla um, alone, pictured alone, of course, King Charles being unwell with his cancer diagnosis. Tell us about what's happened today with this service and how, the, how King, uh, Queen Camilla is representing the royal family today. 
Yeah, I mean, it's been a very poignant uh, service and morning and afternoon here uh, in Worcester, Emily. The Queen, of course, as you say, is alone. His Majesty the King was clearly originally meant to be here instead. Uh, but he did record an audio message of Buckingham Palace a few weeks ago, which has been played out inside Worcester Cathedral during this Maundy Thursday service. And I suppose the highlights of his speech was reaffirming his coronation pledge, which was not to be served but to serve with his whole heart. Uh, he also praised the British public, extending the hands of friendship in, the, in people's times of need. Perhaps a reference there to His Majesty the King, who is, of course, undergoing cancer treatments, as well as the Princess of Wales, also undergoing cancer treatments. Although there was no absolute direct reference to that in his speech, it was solely grounded in religion, because the King started his uh, message by doing a read, reading from the Bible, the Gospel of John, which was talking about Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, which is, is of course the origin of Maundy Thursday, the day before Good Friday, where he was crucified. Um, the Queen was wearing a leopard print chiffon dress and cream cashmere coat by Fiona Clare and golden sapphire flower brooches, which used to belong to Queen Elizabeth II. Um, I believe you're still on live pictures of the entrance of Worcester Cathedral. Uh, Her Majesty is expected to exit the building shortly, uh, where she will greet uh, uh, members. We we have just been following have that and the Queen has now moved on uh, moments ago from the, uh, from the entrance to the cathedral. Uh, so we, we are now uh, looking at you and hearing the bells in the background and seeing sort of the aftermath of her exit. Ah, I see. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, the Queen inside the uh, cathedral has obviously did something which the king would usually do, and that is distribute that Maundy money to 75 men, 75 women, uh, each receiving a red and white purse containing commemorative uh, coins. I do believe, although I'm, fortunately I don't think we've got a shot to show you, we'll try and get some footage up on social media, but Her Majesty the Queen, I believe, might be going to greet members of the public who have gathered. There's a huge crash barrier here uh, with, I reckon, at least 200 people, members of the public uh, who have been here, brave the elements in the rain to try and, of course, greet them. But those commemorative coins, the royal family have been taking part in these Maundy services every year, dating back hundreds and hundreds of years. There's reference to it in the Scottish monarchy in the 1500s. I believe the earliest reference to it on the royal family's website dates back to the uh, 1200s. The last time that Worcester Cathedral hosted the Maundy service was in 1980. The last major royal visit by a member of the royal family to the city of Worcester was during the Queen's Diamond Jubilee back in 2012. That was when Queen Elizabeth II and uh, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, attended a cathedral service here as well as the Guildhall and carried out a number of events uh, along uh, inside the city. Uh, as I said, the Queen has not let yet left the city, although, she, as you said, Tom, she has exited the cathedral. The crowd is still there. I can't quite see from where I am. Yes, Cameron, uh, but Cameron. I believe there we was saw, some vague plan. If the, Cameron, yeah. we, saw, we saw the Queen exiting, leaving the service at the cathedral. We did have a picture of that. We saw the Queen uh, shaking hands with members of the public and greeting them as she exited and walked slowly down the steps out of the cathedral um, there. So lots of people waiting around to see her, lots of people who had been at the service, then moving outside, congregating outside um, to greet Queen Camilla. Absolutely, and of course, as I said, it was originally going to be His Majesty the King accompanying Queen Camilla, um, but we will have a chance to see the King take part in some Easter celebrations because Buckingham Palace has confirmed that both he and Queen Camilla will be at the Easter Sunday service at St George's Chapel in Windsor. It's going to be a scaled back service, I'm told by royal sources. That is due to the King's ongoing cancer treatment and doctors advice that he should not be around too many crowds, which is why mm. the King could not be here in Worcester Cathedral today. Of course, the congregation would have been probably well over uh, a thousand people, but the Queen, Queen very much holding the fort here. The Prince and Princess of Wales, understandably, are taking time out from royal duties to look after their children in the wake of the Princess of Wales's cancer diagnosis, so they're not expected to be at the Easter Sunday service in St George's Chapel 
in Windsor, but other members of the royal family are expected to attend. But as for here in Worcester, it is just the Queen who is here. But the crowds, and from speaking to people earlier today, they were very, very excited to be here and to see a member yes. of the senior royal family uh, uh, as well. She has huge support, that's mm. for sure. Thank you very much indeed, Cameron Walker, our royal correspondent there. Um, very good to speak to you. Yes, absolutely. And from the charming, charming uh, city of Worcester, well, um, we're going to be moving from the charming and uh, lawful city of Worcester to some of the less lawful parts of the country after the break. We're going to be talking about lawless Britain and those stabbings in London. We've got your views that have been coming in thick and fast, and we're going to get to you, get to them after the news headlines. This is Good Afternoon Britain. Good afternoon to you. It's 12.33. I'm Aaron Armstrong. A 19-year-old man's been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after an alleged stabbing on a London train yesterday afternoon. It's said to have happened just before 4pm between Shortlands and Beckenham on a train bound for Victoria Station. Graphic footage shared on social media showed a masked man attacking another man with a large knife while concerned passengers can be heard calling for help. The victim remains in critical but stable condition in hospital. Thames Water shareholders are refusing to inject extra funding to keep it afloat unless the regulator allows bills to rise by up to 40% over five years. They were due to put in half a billion pounds before the end of the month, but have withheld it because they say the business plan's uninvestable. It comes as rowers taking part in this weekend's boat race have been warned about high levels of E. coli in the River Thames as a result of the company dumping raw sewage. Last year's recession was less severe than initially thought, according to new figures from the Office of, for National Statistics, which found the economy still shrunk for two quarters in a row, uh, but the total contraction over that six-month period dropped from 0.5% to 0.1%. A personal message from the King has been broadcast to Worcester Cathedral, marking the Royal Monday service. Uh, the Queen was in attendance with His Majesty telling the service Britain is blessed by all the services that exist for our welfare. He paid tribute to those organisations and their selfless staff and said we all benefit greatly from those who offer us friendship. More on all of our stories uh, available by scanning the QR code on your screen uh, for news alerts or you can go to the website gbnews.com slash alerts. For exclusive, limited edition and rare gold coins that are always newsworthy, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Quick look at the markets. The pound buys you $1.2619 and €1.1697. Uh, gold will cost £1,752 and 1 pence per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,952 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. The latest GB News travel. On the northbound side of the M1, a lane closure and very slow traffic due to an earlier lorry fire. Recovery work continues from 29 for Chesterfield and Mansfield to Markham Vale at 29A. Northbound on the M1, there's also three lanes closed and very slow traffic to an accident from 26 for Nottingham through to 27 for Underwood. Clockwise on the M25, queue into an earlier broken down vehicle from 28 for Brentford through to 29 for Romford and Basildon. Delays to 27 for the M11 interchange, even though all lanes have reopened. A separate accident, though, at Junction 27 has cleared and all lanes are open on the exit slip road. Traffic has also returned back to normal. An earlier broken down vehicle removed on the clockwise side of the M25 at Enfield. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. 
uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%. Pay. And they you said pay. this, you said it again recently, you made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Well, that's now being that's, used. Well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stop paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks ago. The question was asked by the head of a major country in front of everyone else, 28 countries at the time, including us. They said, so if we don't pay our bills, are you going to protect us from Russia? I said, you mean you're delinquent? You're not paying the bills? Yes. Nope. I'm not going to pay you. We're not going to do it. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple and hundreds of billions of dollars came flowing in. Now, if I say, yes, I am, they're not going to pay their bills. Why would they do that? NATO has to treat the U.S. fairly, because if it's not for the United States, NATO literally doesn't even exist. But they took advantage of us, like most countries do. If they start to pay their bills properly, and the club is fair, are places like Poland defended? Will America be there? I believe the United States was paying 90 percent of NATO, the cost of yep. NATO. It could be 100 yep. percent. It was the most unfair thing. And don't forget, it's more important to them than it is to us. We have an ocean in between some problems. It's more important for them. They were taking advantage, and they did. They took advantage of us okay. on trade, and they took advantage on So if the they military. play fair, if they start to play fair, America's there? Yes, 100 percent, 100 percent. Thank you. Right. Well, we have some views coming in about um, all the horrendous news coming from our capital city, London, um, in particular with regards to the spate of stabbings we've seen within 24 hours. Yes, Alan has written in to say maybe this is a clear message of why Stop and Search plays such an important role in helping to catch potential killers who should be locked up for life and more respect given to the police who have to face them. Yes, I think that's a good point. I mean, police do try to apprehend people and stop violence from going on. What are they faced with? Dozens of people with um, cameras in their faces, with their smartphones out before... Um... Anyway, uh, David says TfL would do better concentrating on the safety and security of their passengers, as seen on your news today, and not adverts. <laughs> yes, we have lots of adverts warning us not to be um, inappropriate with others, not to uh, rub yourself I th against I thought someone, this, this might not be... to be... What? This might be in reference to the fact that TfL and Sadiq Khan have banned pictures of hot dogs. Yeah, junk food. On, uh, junk food. Junk, well, not even hot... I mean, hummus is banned Jeez. on TfL adverts. Jeez, anything deemed to be high in fat, sugar Jam. or salt. Jam. Uh, which is just about every kind of food ever. But so I, you can only I have think, a cucumber. I think the adverts with these sinister things telling you how to behave is more worrying mm. on TfL. If you've seen those, I don't know if you have at home. Well, Sean has written in to say the crime rate has soared in London under Sadiq Khan. Why why are Londoners not concerned about this? And he comes out to say, oh, it's all right, guys. We're the safest global city in the world. Well, I'm sorry, but London used to be safer. And I think that's, um, that's yet, just blatantly Sadiq true. And Khan is true. far ahead in the polls and will likely be re-elected with very little opposition. Well, there you go. That is mm. Sadiq Khan's London, and it looks like it may well be for a longer, longer time. I well, do wonder whether there should be a limit on terms for mayors. I mean, oh, he has been in the job term, for yeah. a long time now. He the could Americans be in it. He could limits, technically be in it until, you know, his end of days. Goodness me. Um, well, shall we cross over from London to the West Midlands now? Because Keir Starmer travelled to Dudley today to bemoan the lack of levelling up in the country, saying Boris Johnson did nothing on his flagship policy and that Keir Starmer himself is actually the man to deliver that levelling up agenda. He went to Dudley. But he couldn't have picked a worse place to make his point. Take this. This is Dudley Bus Station, or at least it used to be. It's currently closed. Why? It's undergoing a huge £24 million regeneration with a swanky new bus and tram interchange. Woohoo! In Dudley. In 2022, Dudley opened a new £18 million state-of-the-art leisure centre, named after the local footballing legend Duncan Edwards. 
And there's even an £80 million regeneration scheme across the town centre. It's hard to think of a place in the UK that the levelling up agenda is more visible in. There are hundreds of new homes, 200 student homes, even a 38,000 square foot ice rink being created in the city centre. And yes, it's not all built yet, but it's currently under construction. If there's one place in the United Kingdom where you'd think, my goodness, tens of millions of pounds in levelling up funding have actually gone in, it's Dudley. Well, let us know if you are from Dudley and you're listening or watching to us to the show this afternoon. Dudley is getting a lot of money for various regeneration projects, as Tom so expertly set out there. Um, do you feel it? Mm. Do you feel like your area is levelling up? It's on its way to being levelled up? But, you know, is the quality of life improving in Dudley as a result of Boris Johnson's levelling up funds? How do you feel at home? And is it silly for Keir Starmer to use it as an example of, of a place where levelling up hasn't happened? But here's the clever point, perhaps, that Keir Starmer is relying upon. The bus centre in Dudley is currently closed. Mm. That's really annoying for people who live in Dudley. Yeah. Now, in a few years' time, it will be uh, the most magnificent new state-of-the-art bus and tram How station. Years? How many years? Everything but, takes so long. But, of long. course, while it's being built, it's a massive inconvenience. And this might be the political uh, downfall of the levelling-up agenda. These things take time to build yeah. and people get annoyed while they're being built. So Keir Starmer, if he gets elected, he'll be back there in he'll five years. He'll be able years. to open it, say, look um, what I've done. Cutting, cutting the tape <laughs> And yet it was all Boris Dudley Johnson. It was Boris Johnson and Andy Street who've been sorting yeah. this out rather than, well... Um... Uh, should we speak to the political editor of The Express Online, David Maddox? Now, David, I'm not going to ask your views on Dudley unless you <laughs> very much want to well, I, give I, them. I, I, actually, actually I, I, uh, Dudley's close to my heart. I've, oh. I've... Lots of relatives from Dudley in the past. It's a place I used to visit quite a lot as a child. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see it's uh, getting its levelling up. Does it's, it feel uh, like a place that's on the up, David? Well, I mean, it's been a while since I've been there, but certainly those images you were showing there is a vast improvement from what I remember. And uh, and I, I know, I know the, uh, of course, the MP for Dudley very well, Marco Longhi, who's been extremely active in getting this funding of this money mm. uh, and uh, you know Starmer really as you say couldn't have picked a worse place but of course again as you say when when all this comes into fruition he'll be the first one there I'm sure to take credit <laughs> even though you know obviously it wasn't his but you know it's fairly typical of politicians really well isn't this isn't this the point assuming Keir Starmer wins the election he'll be able to say look Inflation has come down and interest rates are coming down. Look, net migration is going to tumble thanks to the measures that, frankly, have been taken over the last few months about dependence and all the rest of it. That's not going to come into effect until next yes, year after the election. He's going to benefit. benefit from so many policies but, but David, in the last... David, David, can we ask you about Angela Rayner? Because we don't have much time. Now, Angela Rayner, lots of demands that she release her tax affairs because of this... Uh, the police are reassessing whether they should investigate the sale of one of her homes. What's your take on this? Is it cutting through? Uh, I'm not sure it is cutting through yet. I mean, partly because there's been so much kind of sleaze from the other side. Uh, you know, we saw Scott Benton having to quit as an MP uh, the other day, but it was uh, from the Conservative side. Uh, but I think it might get some more cut through as we get closer to an election. I mean, there's certainly a lot of hypocrisy going on here. My colleague, Christian Calgie was uh, at the um, at the launch today, and it dominated the launch. The whole uh, Angela Rayner thing. That's what all people wanted to ask questions about. And he pointed out in his question that Rayner herself, last year, almost this time last year, was telling uh, Nadim Sahawi, who was then a minister, that he that his position was untenable because of questions about his tax affairs. And, you know, the fact is that she's either broken the law, which is the worst case scenario, or the best case scenario, she's used a technicality to avoid in a loophole, if you like, to avoid paying tax, neither of which pass a sniff test by any means. No, and it is very odd that someone who has been the most forthright uh, member of the Shadow Cabinet to come out every single time that she's demanded um, that she's demanded Rishi Sunak release his tax returns, Nadim Zahawi release his tax affairs. But when it comes to her own tax affairs, 
She's refusing to release them. No, 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 the British public should just trust me, she says, David. <laughs> Well, exactly. And I'm afraid that she's not the first a hypocritical politician, nor will she be the last. But, you know, she's certainly been caught out spectacularly. And uh, I'm afraid this will stick. And actually, you know, I suspect if they do win the election, which we all expect they will, and she does become deputy prime minister, this story won't go away. And, you know, once, once you have one bad story like this, others have a habit of following. Mm. Well, it'll be interesting to see. And it does seem that there is often this double standard. Those in government get a lot more scrutiny than those in opposition, so perhaps the tables will turn in time. But, uh, David Maddox, thank you very much for bringing us all of that. Coming up, we're going to be moving on to German beer. Why? We've been told to beware of it. That's the warning from the Foreign Office to football fans. Find out why after this. Hello, very good day to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Another unsettled day ahead with some heavy rain and some strong winds too because we are still under the influence of low pressure like we have been through much of this week. So a blustery and showery theme for many of us. The strongest winds today will be across the south coast. The heaviest rain likely to be across eastern parts of Northern Ireland. We do have a couple of warnings out. The showery rain as it pushes its way northwards across much of England and Wales brings the risk of some hail and some thunder. Meanwhile, across parts of Scotland, we could see some sleet and snow over the higher ground. Temperatures will be around or a little bit below average for the time of year, but feeling noticeably colder in those strong winds. More showery rain to come as we go through this evening, all of it pushing its way northwards. And there will be something a little bit drier and perhaps clearer for a time developing as we go through the early hours of Good Friday. Could allow for touch of frost and a few patches of fog to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. But most places are going to hold up a few degrees above freezing. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday, and again, it is going Going to be a blustery start and some showers developing as we go through the day. Some of them could once more be heavy with some further hail and thunder mixed in, but there should be some drier or perhaps even brighter spells in between the showers. And temperatures are actually going to be up a few degrees compared to today. And with that, the winds will be easing too, so it should feel a little more pleasant. Bye bye. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. It's 12.51 in the afternoon. Now, beware of German beer. That's uh, what the Foreign Office is telling us all, well, telling football fans anyway, travelling to the Euros in Germany this summer. That's because, apparently, German beer packs more of a punch than a British brew. Is that a reason to beware of it? I would have Apparently thought that's so. a reason to embrace it. But uh, fans are being Maybe told you, to drink responsibly as drunk fans risk being barred from football stadiums. Is this, uh, this is just some good, healthy advice, surely? We do know that English football fans sometimes um, disgrace themselves. I mean, <laughs> I love English football fans, but 
do sometimes disgrace I mean, ourselves. I think what, everyone could admit that. Looking at what happened in the Euros a couple of summers ago uh, in in London... Oh, my god! ..and across the... I mean, the chaos... People were looting. They, 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 I mean, there was... The, the, people were climbing on lampposts and scaling buildings, jumping on bus stops. But, but my goodness, if that was on British beer, which is apparently a lot weaker, and I don't know, this, is, this, is, this has got my goat a little bit. It's got your goat. If, if British beer is weaker than German beer, I think we might need to toughen up our beer. I don't like being number two nation. The, we should be number one. The problem with this is, is that I don't actually like beer. I'm more of a wine person. So um, I can't really talk doesn't... about whether the taste is better when it's stronger. I don't know. But um, if, if English football fans are looking for a stronger beer, well, I suspect they probably are. Well, here's the thing. If you're going to go to Germany, you're probably not going to get a pint. You're yeah, going to get a stein. You're going to get a proper, massive stein of beer. And I think, to be honest, people can probably work out for themselves especially football fans, if but, they're getting a bit tipsy. But, OK, so part of the warning is that German beer is stronger. <laughs> but the other part of the warning is that drunk fans could end up barred from stadiums. And I think that probably is good advice. That's I mean, we all enough. know it in theory, and we all know that we shouldn't drink too much. I mean, like at the races or the rugby or the football or whatever it is, whatever sporting event, the English do like to get a bit mm. a bit tipsy. We do, uh, we do. It's, uh, although perhaps not as much as the, as the Germans, let particularly us, the Bavarians. Let uh, us know what you think. Is this nanny state gone mad? Yeah, the... GBviews at gbnews.com is the address. You know it by now. But, um, yeah, have you ever been drunk abroad? We want to hear these stories. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think that this is, um, yeah, the nanny state gone mad? The Foreign Office should butt out of whether you drink strong beer or not? Or, frankly, should we buck up our ideas in Britain and stop, being, stop playing second fiddle to the strength of German beer and really get on their level? Should we should we have more much much stronger drinks here? Well, d does it matter the strength of the beer? I mean, sh depends how much you drink, I guess. Presumably, quality is not only dictated by the strength. No, oh no, very often it's inversely correlated. Oh really? A yeah. weaker pint is actually more tastier. Well, no, not always, not always, and actually sometimes some of the some of the craft beers can be a lot more alcoholic than some of the um, sort of more mass Well, there we go. Perhaps you at home know more about this, but do you think the Foreign Office should be uh, warning English football fans that German beer is a bit too strong and they could end up mm. barred from stadiums? Let us know. But, we'll be uh... back to the manhunt underway for, terror su for t stabbing suspects after this. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. If you're hoping for something a little bit drier, then there is something of a respite over this weekend. But for the time being, the unsettled theme continues. Low pressure firmly in control, like it has been through much of this week, bringing more blustery, showery weather to many places. We still have some strong winds across the south coast as we go through the end of the day and some heavy rain affecting eastern parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a blustery, showery theme across many parts, though the focus of the rain pushing its way into more northern areas overnight with some clearer, drier weather for a time across some parts. Could allow for a touch of frost and a few fog patches to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, most places starting tomorrow on a relatively mild note. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday and there will be some further showery rain around, again, we could see some hail and some thunder mixed in with this, but we should also see some dry and perhaps even bright or sunny spells in between any heavier downpours. Temperatures will be a few degrees higher than today, highs of around 13, 14 Celsius, and the winds will be easing as we go through the day, so that should make it feel a touch more pleasant, perhaps. As we look towards Saturday, and yes, there will still be some showers around, but they don't look as intense, and they look a little bit fewer and further between compared to what we've seen over some recent days. So a greater chance of seeing some drier weather to come. And that's a similar picture for Sunday, but more unsettled weather arriving again by Monday. See you later. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News.
It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's one o'clock on Thursday, the 28th of March. Lawless London. A manhunt is now underway for a man who appeared to randomly stab people on a tube platform in South London, leaving two people fighting for their lives in hospital. We'll keep you updated on this live manhunt. Rayner tax dodge. Angela Rayner refuses again to publish her tax history, insisting the public should believe her when she says she has done nothing wrong. Despite this, the police are now looking again at the sale of one of her houses. And King Charles has spoken of his great sadness at missing the na traditional Maundy Thursday service due to cancer treatment. Queen Camilla attended the service earlier at Worcester Cathedral in his place. And we're asking today, is Britain safe? Perhaps more specifically, is London safe? Two stabbings yesterday in two different locations, three victims, two manhunts, one suspect now arrested, but more clearly on the loose. Do you know what I worry? I worry that people are going to move out of London because they're worried for their safety or fear that, you know, they could get caught up in something like this. I mean, there were people going about their daily commute and what do they see? 
they see a vicious knife attack, uh, which is not what you expect. It's, it's what you saw not in, the, what you expect. in the United States in the 60s and 70s, the so-called donutting effect of cities, mm. the hollowing out of the centre and everyone just moving out and out and out to the suburbs. Uh, uh, London seemed to have bucked that trend in the last 20 years, in a London becoming a lot nicer than, uh, than many reports that it, it was in the 70s and the 80s even. Um, but might we be reversing that trend? Crime was falling from the 90s right through until only a few years ago. I mean, look at Barry. Why would anyone want to visit the capital now? It's beyond me. Sean, the crime rate has soared in London under Steve Khan. Why are Londoners not concerned about it? Believe me, Sean, we are. At least I am. Mm, although Tom writes in to say, good name, by the way, Tom, <laughs> um, it's not only London or the UK out of control. It's sadly Europe. I've lived in Germany for over 40 years and many people here are afraid as crime is getting very bad and more serious. Tom, tell us where you live in Germany. I'd be interested to know if you live in a city, if you live in a town, if you live in a suburb. Let us know. Mm. Write in again to us, yes. Tom. Well, we're going to be getting to many more of your views on the situation of safety in our capital city, in our country and even beyond. We'll be getting to those views throughout the show as we follow this manhunt, but uh, much more on all of our stories after your headlines with Aaron. Hi there, it's two minutes past one. Good afternoon to you. Aaron Armstrong here in the GB Newsroom. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after an alleged stabbing on a London train yesterday afternoon. It happened between Shortlands and Beckenham just before 4pm on a train bound for Victoria Station. Graphic footage shared on social media showed a masked man attacking another man with a large knife, while concerned passengers can be heard calling for help. The victim, who's in his 20s, remains in a critical but stable condition in hospital. Former Met Police detective Peter Blexley says incidents like this have become the norm for emergency services. It's a terrifying experience for anybody who's unfortunate enough to be on that train, I'm sure. But of course, not out of the ordinary for the 999 responders, the paramedics and the police who will have attended this dreadful incident because this is the kind of thing they witness and see the results of only too often, I'm afraid, in Great Britain in 2024. The Chancellor says he believes Thames water is solvent despite shareholders withholding extra cash to keep it afloat. Half a billion pounds was to be injected before the end of the month. Shareholders say the business plan, though, is uninvestable. They want the regulator, Ofwat, to increase customer bills by up to 40% over five years. It comes as rowers taking part in this weekend's boat race have been warned of high levels of E. coli in the river as a result of Thames water dumping raw sewage. Now, the company serves nearly a quarter of the UK's population and has debts of more than £15 billion. Pounds. Treasury will continue to monitor very carefully what's happening at Thames Water. Our understanding is that the company is still solvent and today's news should not have an impact on the services received by customers. Obviously, um, there are parts of the country where the service has not been up to scratch, including in my own constituency, and local MPs will continue to hold Thames Water to account in those situations. But overall, we will continue to watch the situation very carefully. Now, uh, last year's recession was less severe uh, than was first thought. That's according to revised figures. The Office for National Statistics found the economy still shrunk in the final six months of the year, uh, but overall grew by 0.1% across the whole of 2023. Now, the government says it's proof their plan is working. The Labour leader says Britain wants change, as he outlined his party's local election campaign. Speaking at an event in the West Midlands, Sir Keir Starmer pledged a national renewal. He's promised to axe zero hour contract and give new powers to local mayors to rejuvenate high streets. Stability with Labour or more chaos with the Tories? Unity or division? Renewal or decline? A changed Labour Party ready to serve the interests of working people? Or a Conservative Party that has forgotten how to serve anything other than itself. The Archbishop of Canterbury has called on people to pray this Easter weekend for the jail journalist Evan Gershkovich. Uh, Good Friday marks a year since the Wall Street Journal reporter was detained in Russia on charges of spying. 
No evidence has been presented for the allegations. He's the first US journalist to be arrested in Russia since the Cold War. Justin Welby says journalists around the world should be protected and free to hold those in power to account. Millions of people are being urged to send meter readings to their energy supplier to ensure they don't overpay. The average household energy bill is to fall to its lowest point in two years from next month after Ofgem lowered its price cap. So it will drop 12.3% from next Monday, uh, lowering average yearly bills from £1,900 to around £1,700. It's a saving of about £20 every month. If you're planning on travelling this Easter weekend, though, you might want to set your alarm clock. The RAC is warning of long delays with journeys on some of the most popular routes taking twice as long as they should. Uh, the bank holiday weekend coincides with the Easter holidays, uh, so some 14 million journeys are expected over the next few days. Uh, much of the congestion will start this evening, so people are being advised to travel outside peak times. And a personal message from the King's been broadcast to Worcester Cathedral, marking the Royal Maundy service. The Queen was in attendance, as His Majesty told the service, Britain's blessed by services that, that exist for our welfare. He paid tribute to those organisations and their selfless staff and said we all benefit greatly from those who offer us friendship. Updates available for you at GB News Alerts. You can get them by scanning the QR code on your screen or our website has more details. Now, it's back to Tom and Ellie. Good afternoon, Britain. It's eight minutes past one and a 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a man was stabbed on a train between Beckenham Junction and Shortlands Railway Station in South London on Wednesday. Yes, well, let's cross to GB News reporter Ray Addison, who joins us from Shortlands Railway Station. Ray, what do we know? An arrest has been made. Yes, we know that a 19-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder and a knife has also been recovered by police detectives. Now, they received a call just before 4pm yesterday afternoon. Reports that two men had been fighting as they entered a train here at Shortlands Station. And then, of course, we saw that shocking footage uh, on social media uh, of a man wearing black clothing and a face mask. And, of course, that uh, in incident seemed to be very disturbing to passengers. One could be heard calling for an ambulance in quite a distressed way. Now, that train ultimately stopped at Beckenham Junction train station, which is just a short two to three minute journey from Shortlands. And ultimately, there was a very large police presence there at the train station. And a man in his 20s was treated at the scene and then taken, uh, we believe, by air ambulance to a major trauma centre here in London. Now, as part of this update, we're being told he's in a critical but stable condition and specialist officers are assisting his family. Now, British Transport Police issuing a statement saying they understand the concerns of the public following this incident. Their detectives have been working tirelessly to investigate. They hope that this arrest will bring some reassurance to those on the rail network. Now, locals that I've been talking to uh, are not sounding very reassured, I have to say. They say that this area uh, of Bromley has changed significantly in recent years. Uh, they've seen, they say, an increase in violent incidents and they're concerned, they tell me, to let their children use the rail network. Now, one man said that this area of Bromley is actually a particular hot spot because there are no ticket barriers here at Shortland Station. He says that, he feels, gives people licence to kind of come and go. They feel like they're not being watched as closely and they can come here and commit crime. I went and talked to the station staff and they said there's never been any ticket uh, barriers here at the station. So high visibility patrols are being increased, we're told. I haven't seen any uh, so far. However, we're told they will be across the rail network to reassure passengers. Ray Addison, thank you very much for joining us there outside Shortlands Station in a developing story. But of course, elsewhere, a second manhunt is underway for a man who appears to randomly stab people on a tube platform in Kennington, South London, leaving two people fighting for their lives again in hospital. We'll keep you updated. Our Home and Security Editor joins us from Kennington now. And Mark, this manhunt still underway. 
Yeah, it was 10.30 last night that this incident unfolded on the northbound platform of the Northern Line going through Kennington Tube Station and it caused absolute panic and evacuation of the station. We got uh, some video that we can show you that was captured by some of those uh, in the area last night as this was unfolding uh, of the people being evacuated from the station, the emergency services arriving en masse here to de deal with not one but two victims down on that platform. Now, according to British Transport Police, a man was attacked and stabbed, first of all, and it appears then that another commuter waiting on the platform tried to intervene very bravely to try to stop that stabbing attack and then got attacked himself. So it really does show the dangers. Yes, of course, it's a really brave act to try to help someone who's in trouble like that, but then you put yourself at risk from someone uh, with a deadly weapon. Both these men are now in hospital. They were taken to a major trauma centre in central London. Their conditions are described as critical but stable today. And the manhunt now is continuing for the suspect. Interestingly and perhaps surprisingly, we have had nothing from British Transport Police on this suspect. Any kind of description, no picture taken from CCTV or elsewhere of their suspect. Now, that might indicate that actually they have a suspect in mind and they're not at the stage that they feel they need to call on the public's help to try to identify mm. someone. Uh, so that might mean that an arrest is perhaps just hours away. Yes. Have, have we heard anything, Mark, in terms of political reaction? Have we heard from the London Mayor, for example? Sadiq Khan, he did say that London is the safest global city. Yeah, I'm not aware of uh, Sadiq Khan having said anything uh, about these attacks. He may well have done, but of course he defends, as he is, the mayor, uh, London, and believes that it is, in comparison to the massive global cities around the world, a safe city. Um, and it depends how you look at it. It is a huge city and it grapples with a violent crime problem. And, of course, there are years when that violent crime overall is down on what it was the year before. But there is a persistent problem in this city of youth uh, violent crime in which teenagers are being caught up in either knife or gun crime uh, and at a very significant rate. And, you know, that, that really is of concern. We have programmes that are underway by the Metropolitan Police and others to try to deal with this issue. But it is a persistent problem of people who are carrying deadly weapons and who, it seems, are only too prepared to use them uh, when an argument breaks out. Now, we don't know, with regard to this incident in Kennington, what it was sparked by, but the British Transport Police say at this stage they believe that the victims didn't know the attacker. Um, so it may have been a random attack that, as yet, we have no idea of what the motivation was. Yes, really, really concerning stuff. But, Mark, I suppose in the other stabbing we saw yesterday, it took 20 hours for the police to crack down on at least one suspect, one arrest. Might we be looking at a similar time frame in this double stabbing incident? It seems that the police do actually, uh, when they sort of crack down on a manhunt like this, they do very often quite quickly get their suspects. Yes, I mean, when you have a, a major incident unfolding and lots of police resources and detective resources that are then sent to deal with that incident, they uh, begin by, of course, speaking to all of the people who have been closely involved in the incident, the people on the train, look for descriptions. They've got that valuable video that was taken by a member of the public on the train as well. And then, in quick time, they're looking at the CCTV, both from the train and from the station and surrounding streets, to get a look at this individual. He was wearing uh, what appeared to be a COVID mask for some of the time, there's other images that have been 
captured of someone answering that description in a street nearby. So at some point, that mask may have been taken down and that person may be visible. They're usually also able, uh, through the fact that we are such a heavily surveilled capital city here in London, uh, they're usually able to keep uh, a track on individuals through CCTV uh, to get an indication of where they're going and that can lead them quite quickly to a suspect. <clears throat> I mean, I say quite quickly, it's all relative. These things are time consuming. You need multiple officers looking at all of the available CCTV and speaking to eyewitnesses. Thank you very much indeed, Mark White, our Home and Security Editor there in Kennington. Um, well, joining us now is reformed gang member and youth re rehabilitator, Sicarius McGrath. Thank Sicarius you very much McGrath. for joining us on the show today, Sicarius. Um, the question that lots of people will be asking is what on earth can be done to prevent these kind of incidents? Um, two stabbing incidents in the space of a few hours in our capital city, in South London and thereabouts. Uh, what can be done? Yeah, um, in respect of gang incidents or knife crime that's affiliated to gangs, um, I think there's programmes that are in place at the moment. I've highlighted this previously. I don't think they're effective. And, you know, the amount of funding is there. People say it's funding. It's a funding problem. That's not correct. I've seen the amount of money has been given to third sector agencies and charities and organisations, and some are receiving hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, there's people on big, big salaries 40, 50, 60, 70 K a year that are actually doing absolutely nothing and are not reducing the issue. So it's not a funding issue. Uh, I think the issue is where the funding is going um, and who's doing what on the ground. We've got, you know, people left, right and centre getting out of bed and defining, self-defining as a youth worker, but they've never uh, attained a degree in youth work. They've got no expertise. They're just self-identifying as youth workers, as experts, as professionals. And they're going into schools, they're talking to kids, and it's rehabilit allegedly rehabilitating people in communities. But that's not not the case. That's not reality. It, it's a false perception, and that's why we're seeing a rise in these issues uh, and, and a drastic spread in them. That is so interesting. To, to some extent, all the money that is being spent on this is being spent uh, in, in the wrong way, perhaps in the wrong places, perhaps a lot of it going to the wrong individuals. And how can we get money going to the right individuals? Or, frankly, is it not even about the money, but about the strategy now? Yeah, look, everyone always says to me it's a funding issue. That's not the case. 100% that's not the case. I've seen funding from central and local government being put into programmes, uh, knife crime, gun crime, serious youth violence. But the issue we have, it's going to the wrong people on the streets and it's going to the wrong charities and organisations. Um, and and that's, that's why we're not seeing a decline in youth violence and we're seeing it spread further afield. And, you know, there could be years where it lowers and then there's a spike the following year, but... Nevertheless, we're seeing a spread in this ideology and it's going from the main inner cities to, to the smaller towns and villages mm -hmm. outside of London, Birmingham, Liverpool and Manchester, for example. So, um, Doris, we... We, uh, sorry, we introduced you as a reformed gang member and um, perhaps you can speak to this about why people carry weapons, particularly young people in urban areas. Why are they carrying weapons? And in your mind, has the... Has it accelerated in recent years, or is this a problem that is just highlighted every time there's an incident like these? Well, we've always had knife crime as far back as I can remember. What we're seeing now, over the last decade or so, is the victims and the perpetrators getting younger and younger. Um, we're often seeing cases in which the perpetrator and the victims are around 12 years of age, 13 years of age. we never seen that two decades ago, so we're seeing uh, a spread in this ideology, and that's what uh, that's the issue, and that's a significant change which I've seen. There is one program. Uh, there's an individual from the West Midlands. Uh, I think she operates on the Priest Consultancy. Her name's uh, Rayan Priest. She's actually developed the program. She's implementing a program which I've looked at myself, and other people have looked at around me, and we believe it's going to be highly effective. So. You know, it's people like that that we need. Mm. She, she's a qualified youth worker. She's got a degree in youth work. She's a mm. criminologist. 
It, it, she goes out and, and engages with people on the streets, on the front line. And uh, to me, she's one of the most effective mm. individuals in this game. And Sicarius, just in a sentence, if you would, how did you get out of it? You were involved in, in, in gang crime for, for, for years. What, what enabled you to reform yourself? Look, I think with age, the propensity for violence reduces. The, uh, we don't see 70, 80 year olds running around with guns and knives. So as we increase in age, our propensity to use weapons and to commit violence declines. But n nevertheless, we're still experiencing it. And people get out of it for different reasons. Um, mine was for one reason, but the next person may not have those same reasons. So we all have, we need that wake up call, but mm. we, it's education. And as you asked mm. before the question, why the kids carry knives? It's a number of factors, not, not every two cases are the same. They could be for protection, it could be because they're involved in gangs in case you see adversaries or rivals. Uh, it could just be because they've got that propensity for violence and, and that's what they want to do to get a reputation and mm. develop a reputation in their own group or to or to, to deter other mm. gangs or it could be a lot well, of it is drug related, county lives related and so on. Yeah, well, thank you very much indeed for your time and good luck with the, the work you're doing to uh, help young people choose a different path. Sicarius McGrath there, youth re re rehabilitator. Thank mm -hmm. you very much indeed. Well, coming up, Prince Harry's failed bid to reinstate police protection cost the taxpayer a whopping half a million quid. Much more on that story after the break. Mm -hmm. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Shocking new study says that vaping might be linked to cancer. Not that shocking. It found e-cigarettes can cause similar DNA changes to cells of smoking, leading experts to claim that vaping does not seem as harmless as originally billed. So joining us now is Robert Sidebottom from the UK Vaping Industry Association. Good morning, Robert. Um, is this terrible news for your industry? I imagine you're going to try and defend uh, the products still and say that there's still a lot more research to be done. Well, I don't need to really defend the products because I think actually if you read the article and you read the detail in the article, I mean, it actually starts and it states with, while this doesn't mean that vaping has the same degree of cancer risks as, as smoking does, it implies that vaping may have negative health impacts. However, we've, we've never said that vaping is completely risk-free, and we've always said that it is 95% safer than smoking, which it is. We accept that further research needs to be done, and actually we welcome studies into the health impact of vaping, as we want to give every former smoker the full confidence that vaping is considerably safer than smoking, and that's, it, that's the important message. But that's about the former smokers. What about the young people who are taking up vaping, Robert? It's better, these, not these to vape. it's better not to vape at all, and we know why they take up smoking, because you lure them into your shops with silly flavours called bubblegum. Well, we can get into the flavour debate. That's no problem at all, because, you know, adults like flavours. I, you know, particularly I love squashy sweets. Uh, these products, and let's be absolutely clear, are not for children. They are an age-gated mm. product that are for adults only. And, hope and that is exactly who they should be and sold hopefully, to. Um, I'm so sorry, Rob, we've run out of time, but and hopefully oh. this research will show that they certainly are not for children. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
this 126 you're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, Queen Camilla visited Worcester Cathedral today for the Royal Maundy Thursday service. As the King has said, it is with great sadness he can't attend. But a pre-record message played out at the service with the King reaffirming his coronation pledge not to be served, but to serve, whilst outlining a poignant message that Jesus has set an example for us to care for each other. Well, Cameron Walker joins us now, our GB News royal correspondent from Worcester, just outside the cathedral where the uh, service took place. And Cameron, uh, how was the Queen received? Uh, very warmly, Tom. The crowds were huge here, actually. And when Her Majesty left the cathedral, uh, there was huge cheers for the Queen, who decided to get out of her royal car uh, and then greet as many members of the crowd as possible. She stayed well beyond her scheduled time of departure, which perhaps shows uh, just how much she was, A, enjoying herself, and how much, B, the crowd was uh, loving that she was there and spending time with them. But, of course, it was also very poignant because His Majesty the King uh, was meant to be distributing that morning money to 75 men and women of the local community, 75 being each year of the King's life. But the Queen did it on his behalf. But as you said, Tom, uh, the King did record an audio message in Buckingham Palace a couple of weeks ago, and he highlighted and reaffirmed his coronation pledge, which was not to be, not to serve, uh, not, to, sorry, not to be served, but to serve with his whole heart. He also praised the extended hands of friendship in people's times of need and perhaps nods to both him and the Princess of Wales receiving cancer treatment. That was not a part of his message. He did not refer to uh, the, his cancer or indeed the Princess of Wales during that speech. It was very much uh, deeply rooted in religion. He started uh, his message by reading from the Bible, from the Gospel of John, which is all about uh, Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, which is the root of Maundy Thursday, the day before Good Friday, uh, where he was crucified uh, on a cross. And then, of course, the Queen, as I said, was distributing that Maundy money as part of the service. Worcester Cathedral, the last time it hosted the Maundy service was in 1980. So it doesn't happen very often uh, in this city, which is why perhaps the crowds were so enthusiastic that Queen Camilla was there to greet her. And it also shows, of course, just how perhaps loved she is. But there also was a bit of an interesting moment where the Republic protests, which were here when the Queen arrived, retreated out out of the crowds because the heavens opened and it was very rainy but by the time Camilla came out to greet the crowds Republic has left. <laughs> that is oh, good. quite amusing that the Royalists will stay there come uh, rain or shine but the Republicans scurry away. Well Cameron Walker thank you very much for bringing us that. Fair weather protesters. <laughs> anyway in other royal news reports reveal Prince Harry's failed legal bid to overturn a Home Office decision, the decision that denied him the right to police protection, has cost the taxpayer more than £500,000. Well, we're joined now by the former royal correspondent at The Sun, Charles Ray. And, Charles, this is an astonishing amount of money. Uh, well, yes. I mean, I think if you start taking court cases, it, uh, it's not a cheap matter uh, at all. And it's uh, Harry has not endeared himself yet again to the British public. It's cost them £500,000 to fight the cases. The only... The only good thing about it is it's cost him a million pounds uh, in those two cases uh, in costs. And let's not forget that he uh, also uh, had to pay £750,000 uh, for the failed uh, action against the Mail on Sunday, which had originally written the story about him wasting, um, you know, taking that action uh, to try and get uh, police protection. Uh, of course, to weigh against that, he has got a substantial sum from the Mirror newspapers. So these actions are still going on, and you mentioned the 500,000. Uh, he's now, He and his legal team are now yet again considering fighting this case again, appearing against it, which has been rejected twice, which probably would add another £250,000 of public money to those costs. Not again. I mean, I'm just reading here that this uh, sum included £180,000 yeah. for counsel, £320,000 for the government legal department, 2300 in court fees and almost £10,000 in e-disclosure. Does he think we're made of money? Well, ex exactly. And the only, the only winners in all this, of course, Emily, are, are lawyers who are very, very expensive at that level, um, or, you know, when, when they're dealing with uh, the, 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 that sort of court case. So it, it's not a, cheap, not a cheap matter. And, of course, we keep on paying for the 
uh, you know, the the, the, the defence side, if you like, uh, because it is our money that has to fight these cases. Lots of people will be asking, why on earth is this still going on? This is a saga that has been going on and on and on. So many different elements, so many different courts, so many appeals after appeals after appeals. At what point does the prince think, hang on, perhaps we should stop clogging up the courts with this? I don't think he's got that in his makeup, to be perfectly honest, Tom. He has got this bee in his bonnet that he, as a royal prince, despite quitting the royal family, working royal family, uh, he's got this bee in his bonnet that, uh, that Britain is an unsafe country. And so when he comes here with his family, and he hasn't been, he hasn't brought his family here for at least a year, uh, that he should have proper police protection. Uh, the, the, the police here say they will look at his visits mm. in this country on a, a you know on a basis of when he's coming he's got to give 30 days notice and then they will decide where he's going to go and what protection he can be afforded now if he's going to visit the royal family um he will be within the 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 ring of steel that that the police is is around the royal family if he's not then he doesn't deserve the protection he's even trying to rent british police to yeah. um to, to, to protect him and his family. I mean, he's due here, I think, uh, it next month or maybe six May, weeks. May, I time. think. Yeah, May. You, you, you get, there's an Invictus ceremony that he's got to attend or will attend. And we'll have to wait and see if he's actually going to see any other members of the royal family. Well, we shall see. But in the meantime, it's costing us all. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Charles Ray, former Pleasure. royal correspondent for The Sun. Always great to speak to you. Yes. Now, uh, yesterday is being called a day of carnage because the capital saw two separate stabbing attacks, leaving three people now in a critical condition. So we want to have the debate, have the police lost control of our streets. We're going to be debating that very shortly with a special GB News star. Hi there, it is 1.33. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. A 19-year-old man's been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after an alleged stabbing on a London train yesterday afternoon. It happened just before 4pm between Shortlands and Beckenham on a train bound for Victoria Station. A footage shared on social media showed a masked man attacking another man with a large knife while concerned passengers looked on. They can be heard calling for help. The victim remains in critical but stable condition in hospital. Thames Water shareholders are refusing to inject extra funding to keep it afloat unless the regulator allows bills to rise by up to 40% over five years. They were due to put in half a billion pounds before the end of the month, but have withheld it because they say the business plan is uninvestable. It comes as rowers taking part in this weekend's boat race have been warned about high levels of E. coli in the River Thames as a result of the company dumping raw sewage. Millions of people are being urged to send meter readings to their energy supplier to ensure they don't overpay. The average household bill is to fall to its lowest point in two years from next month after Ofgem lowered its price cap, so it'll drop 12.3% from next Monday. Uh, average yearly bills will go down from £1,900 to £1,700, an average saving of about £20 a month. And the king has reaffirmed his coronation pledge not to be served, but to serve, and spoke of his great sadness at missing the Royal Monday service. His comments were broadcast to Worcester Cathedral as he takes time away from public events uh, to recover from uh, cancer. The queen was in attendance, though. Uh, his Majesty also uh, thanked Britain for its services and paid tribute to those organisations and their selfless staff. For the latest on all of our stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts, uh, scan the QR code on your screen, or go to our website for more details. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Quick look at the markets. The pound buys you $1.2637, $1.2637. 
1692 euros. Uh, the price of gold is 1750 pounds and 51 pence per ounce and the FTSE 100's at 7954 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News financial report. Hello, very good day to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Another unsettled day ahead with some heavy rain and some strong winds too because we are still under the influence of low pressure like we have been through much of this week. So a blustery and showery theme for many of us. The strongest winds today will be across the south coast. The heaviest rain likely to be across eastern parts of Northern Ireland. We do have a couple of warnings out. The showery rain as it pushes its way northwards across much of England and Wales brings the risk of some hail and some thunder. Meanwhile, across parts of Scotland, we could see some sleet and snow over the higher ground. Temperatures will be around or a little bit below average for the time of year, but feeling noticeably colder in those strong winds. More showery rain to come as we go through this evening, all of it pushing its way northwards. And there will be something a little bit drier and perhaps clearer for a time developing as we go through the early hours of Good Friday. Could allow for touch of frost and a few patches of fog to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. But most most places are going to hold up a few degrees above freezing. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday, and again, it is going to be a blustery start and some showers developing as we go through the day. Some of them could once more be heavy with some further hail and thunder mixed in, but there should be some drier or perhaps even brighter spells in between the showers. And temperatures are actually going to be up a few degrees compared to today. And with that, the winds will be easing too. So it should feel a little more pleasant. Bye bye. The latest GB News travel. Hi, good afternoon to you. I'm Jules Buckley. Now, there's uh, problems on the northbound M6 this lunchtime at Junction 5, Castle Bromwich. Now, two of the four lanes there are coned off. A lorry involved in a collision. There's been a spillage of diesel there as well. So, queues back to Coles Hill at uh, Junction 4. The exit up there northbound at uh, Junction 5 is also partially blocked. Northbound M40 queuing. There's a breakdown from Loudwater at 3, heading up to Fort the High Wycombe Handy Cross roundabout, and that's causing delays. Anti clock M25 still slow going following an earlier collision junction 26 to 25 that's Waltham Abbey to Enfield but all lanes are back open and the A30 in Devon closed both ways between the Woodley Junction in Cheriton Bishop and Fingal Glen by the Pathfinder Village closed and queuing for a serious collision and for now that's your latest you can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Is Britain becoming lawless? That's the question we're asking at uh, 39 minutes past one. We've been hearing stabbings were rife across London transport yesterday, with a manhunt underway for an attack on Kennington tube platforms and a 19-year-old arrested after he allegedly stabbed a man on a train in broad daylight in Beckingham. Beckenham. Brazen. Now, three people have been left in a critical condition. So, our question we're asking is, have the police lost control of our streets? Joining us now is GB News presenter Patrick Christie's, who thinks police have absolutely lost control, and the former police superintendent, Leroy Logan, who feels they haven't. So, um, Patrick, tell us why you believe the police have lost control. Yeah, I mean, it brings me absolutely no joy to say this. And by the way, I don't think this is entirely, in every case, the police's fault. But to answer your question, yes, they have lost control. Knife crime up 5% in England and Wales on last year, 22% up in London, a 19% increase in knife point robberies. If we move to the northeast now, we see that there's been a 500% increase in sexual crimes, a 6,000% increase. This is since 2014, by the way, in stalking and harassment cases. Shoplifting is through the roof. Why do you now need to go? 
window and ask a cashier behind the counter to get you some fabric softener, well, it's because all the others have been nicked. There's been a perceived two-tier policing uh, protest. Drugs are out of control, aren't they? And public confidence is at the lowest level. That was an independent watchdog that came out last year. Just to summarise that and how much I think they have lost control, there was a police station that closed in Streatham and was turned into a million-pound cannabis farm. Right, well, uh, Leroy, do you believe the police have lost control of the streets? Um, I don't believe they've lost control of the streets, and I don't think it's um, really reasonable to say that uh, it's out of control. Uh, I mean, yes, crime is high, and it's in the wrong direction mm. in many uh, areas, and the, the police need to get a grip of it. Um, but I also think that um, various crimes... Um, they're, they are predicated by people's circumstances. Um, I'm not giving excuses for people carrying knives uh, or going looting, um, but there's always causes behind these things. You know, um, it, it's not just being tough on crime, and, and I know about enforcement and the courts and the prison system, but it's also getting into the causes of it. We need to have really culturally competent um, type of policing, knowing where the feuds are happening, who are the problem families going into um, um, the, these conflicts, mm. what, where, how people are starting to get together around going into um, shops and looting and all these sort of things. We need to recognise how social media has contributed to this and it's got these sort of weird and wonderful collaboration for people coming together and believing they can just storm stores and everything like this. So it, 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 it's not just about um, losing control. It's around um, we collectively, as the public, trying to support each other so that you don't have um, people running wild on the streets of London. OK, Leroy, let's it, pass that back to police. Patrick now. Patrick, not necessarily all on the police. Yeah. This is a problem with society. Yeah, I mean, un unquestionably, it is a problem with society. I think we can't also underestimate the impact that inexplicable police cuts coupled with rapid mass population growth have had. I mean, I think that seems pretty obvious. And um, I don't think the police help themselves at times, though. And I know that these might be isolated incidents, but things like doing the Macarena at a gay pride event or twerking at Notting Hill Carnival, for example, or policing non-crime hate incidents online, I'm not sure that's really getting in amongst the more serious crimes, like stabbings, like gun crimes, like drugs as well. I think sometimes they are maybe afraid of the optics a bit too much. I know that there were certain issues around the BLM protests, I think more recently as well, when it comes to the pro-Palestine protests uh, that we've seen. I think the appearance is at least maybe they are too worried about how this could be cut up. Uh, there have also been problems, I think, when it comes to undermining the respect of police officers, not least because they don't appear to always be that good at policing themselves. I could rattle off several examples. Wayne mm. Cousins is probably the most obvious one uh, as well. I think as well they're not always backed up by the higher-ups, are they, when it comes to things? I know firearms officers recently have felt incredibly hard done by and handed in quite a few of their weapons and will not be reapplying for the role, a perception that maybe there is a yeah. rush to litigation against their own. Absolutely. Uh, Leroy, do the police sometimes, sometimes project weakness? Uh, Patrick gave that example of how the protests, for example, a lot of people saying they, the police took a, take a very, you know, soft touch. I'll agree that they haven't been consistent around um, policing a lot of the protests, especially around the issues of um, Gaza and Israel and... Um, whereas they can be seen very heavy-handed when it comes to uh, football um, events or, or, you know, and something of a different nature. So, yeah, they need to be consistent. There needs to be that strong ethical leadership to ensure that they deploy the assets in, in an intelligence and, and, a, and a proportionate um, and reasonable way. You, we've got to ensure that our policing is consistent, whether you are... A, a, very privileged end of life or you're deprived in, in some way. There, there, there seems to be an inconsistency, and that's down to the leadership. But I know the majority of officers are doing an excellent job in, in very tough circumstances. As has already been highlighted, austerity trashed uh, uh, community cops. It closed down the police stations. Uh, we've seen morale nose diving, lots of people leaving, not only just handing back their firearms, but they're actually leaving. And, of course, 
the the reputation was hit by Carrick and Cousins and all these other sexual mm. predators. So the only way is up. So uh, it really needs the, the real ethical leadership, not, not only at the top of, of the Met and other police services, but at the Home Office, when yeah. we had an overindulgent um, Home Secretary like Suella Breverman, well, etc., getting put, involved in operational that policing. Point, Pat that was the worst thing we needed. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, Patrick, do you think we just need tougher police officers? Are they... Uh, have we got, you know, some people say too many graduates, mm. too much form filling and not enough tough, you know... Can I just say who... something? Yeah. I was a graduate and I wasn't stuffed on policing. <laughs> so I hear this thing about graduates. I was a graduate and I, it actually helped me to be a more effective mm. and objective officer. So please, I hate these stereotypes about too many graduates. Okay, Although, well, Leroy, that was back before universities turned down a peculiar path that they have in the last few years. But, um, Patrick, final word to you. Uh, yeah, no, look, I, I, I think that actually there is a serious shout as to whether or not we should be paying police officers more to try to attract better ones and to try to make sure that uh, more people are actually seeing it as a career choice. I do think that that is an area to be had as well. I do also actually think that there needs to be an element of personal responsibility. It can't all be down to the police. I don't think a new youth centre would stop people uh, stabbing each other in the streets a lot of the time, for example. I think there has to be a look at the breakdown in maybe the nuclear family uh, uh, as well, uh, but not just police. But, yes, I would like to see police officers perhaps a little bit less afraid and get more backing from politicians. There is a perception that perhaps some politicians are very quick to jump on things like whether it's police racism or whether it's police sexism or all of those things, all of which are bad, but I would like to see politicians coming out into back, going over the top for our police officers more and our police officers not being afraid to do things like more stop and search. Well, there we go. What Great a fantastic discussion. discussion. Really, really interesting points on either side. Uh, Patrick, Leoy, thank you for your time. Amazing stuff. Good stuff. Well, uh, and let us know what you made of that. GBV's at gbnews.com. But grab your raincoats in the meantime, because uh, this Easter could be rather wet and windy, with a particular dampener predicted for our bank holiday celebrations. Whoopee. We'll hear from a weather expert next. Breakfast every day from 6 a.m. Could we talk about um, uh, opening up the new uh, Bond role <gasps> to someone, Alex? And, oh, um, yes. This is an actor called Aaron Taylor Johnson. Right. Do you remember when the director of the Fifty Shades of Grey films had a young, young boyfriend? Really, really young, like half her age. It was in all the papers at the time. Well, it turns out that was him. He broke his career, I think, in a film called Kick Ass, which was, I, I watched it, really great film. You can't compare, what's his name? Who's, who's the last Bond? Daniel, Daniel Craig. Craig. Daniel Craig, you can't to Roger. compare. You but you can't... can't compare Roger Moore to Sean Connery either. No. Who's your favourite Bond? Uh, my favourite Bond is Piers Brosnan, probably. Same. Really? Oh, come on, maybe yes. Sean Connery, maybe For Sean. the classics. Yeah. I'm quite keen on Roger Moore. So, but I, I quite like the kind of, uh, the ironic raise but, of the eyebrow and all well, that. Well, Interesting, this sort of puts to death all of those rumours that James Bond was going to be a woman, James Bond was going to be a black man. There was lots of different rumours going around of what they were going to do with Idris his role. Idris would be good. He hasn't signed yet. A he feminist, hasn't. I would say James Bond shouldn't be a woman. I totally agree. Because we need to have our own stories that we tell yeah. and our own we heroes. We don't need to, yes. to kind of go in on that. We just need to have a story that celebrates a woman, I think. I agree. Who is your favourite, Eamon? So I do think, if you, if you look at them all, there's not a bad one amongst them. Mm. But um, personally... Personally, I got to know Roger Moore and um, an absolute gentleman oh. and a man who was a star in every sense of the word, and an impossibly handsome looking mm. man. Mm. Pierce, I think Pierce, very, very good. And Pierce, again, is a very likable oh, yeah. fellow. Very, very, very likable. <laughs> yeah. It's um, funny you say that the appetite, I think, for James Bond kind of is still there, but they are reinventing it. And the fact, that, the fact that they change it and kind of go with the time. I thought Daniel Craig was very good, actually. Can't I just struggled them. with Daniel Craig the most because I just couldn't cope with blonde Bond. So the idea of a female Bond or, you know, <laughs> I, I Anything couldn't else, cope yeah. with Daniel Craig, so... 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel.
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's just gone 10 to 2, and this bank holiday weekend is right around the corner. But heavy rain and strong winds could disrupt travel uh, and pose a risk to safety in the run-up to the Easter weekend. Oh, great. Just what we all want to hear. <laughs> so for those travelling over the bank holiday weekend, the RAC have advised drivers to beware of changing road conditions. Well, joining us now is presenter and meteorologist at the Met Office. Who better to speak to? Alex Burkill. Alex, it's going to be an absolute wash out not totally it's fair to say that there will be quite a bit of unsettled weather around particularly today we have a number of wind uh, number of warnings in force there are strong winds along the south coast heavy rain heavy downpours across lots of places but particularly northern ireland here we're going to see some high rainfall totals building up but it's worth bearing in mind that the weather's easing as we go through the weekend. That being said, there will still be something a bit unsettled around tomorrow. Lots of people heading on the roads on the first day of the long weekend, and there could be some heavy downpours. Watch out for hail, watch out for thunder, and still some blustery winds. But definitely things are going to be turning a bit more settled. Mm. Alex, what I want to know is, am I safe for my traditional Sunday Easter egg hunt in the garden? Will it at least be dry for that? There are some signs that, yeah, actually Easter Sunday, Easter Day doesn't look too wet. There will be some showers around. There's a potential for some heavier, more persistent rain, perhaps in the southwest. But for many of us, there will be quite a bit of dry weather around. The dry weather definitely looks more oh, prolonged. Good. There'll be more sunshine than we've seen recently. Oh, that's a relief. Um, is it unseasonably cold? at the moment. I was uh, walking to work this morning and it felt like a January day. It is a bit chilly at the moment. Temperatures are around or a little bit below average for quite a few of us. And we also have some strong blustery winds. As I said before, we actually have a wind warning for southern coastal parts. And just generally at the moment, it is blustery. And that's adding to the cold feel, making it feel much cooler than you might expect, particularly as we head towards Easter. The winds will be easing as we go through the weekend and temperatures rising by Saturday, Sunday. We're looking quite many places will be getting into the low to mid teens. And with those easing winds, it should feel more pleasant, more spring like a bit warmer, but mm -hmm. hopefully not warm enough to melt any Easter eggs that you may be hiding. <laughs> well, just finally, and we do literally have one minute left. Where's best to be in the UK this weekend and where's worst? Well, that's a difficult one because there will be a lot of showery rain around and showers by their nature hit and miss. So some places might avoid them, whilst other places not too far away could get a heavy downpour. So a bit tricky to say where it's going to be best and worst. But I think most of us will have some fine weather at times, but not through the whole weekend. Very diplomatic. Amazing. Very diplomatic answer. Thank you very much, Alex Burkill, who is presenter and meteorologist at the Met Office. Good stuff. Yeah, although these showers, it's the get out clause, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Could happen, could not. I, I probably should have asked, um, where would you like to be this weekend <laughs> if you had to choose somewhere to yeah. have an egg hunt? Well, it sounds like the southwest might be a bit, a bit wet, but... Uh, You're going to dress as what? a bunny this weekend? <laughs> I've, nice. never, I've never dressed as a bunny in my life. Um, but uh, trigger warnings at universities. Where has been banning books, or at least warning about books, in our campuses that after this? Again. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. If you're hoping for something a little bit drier, then there is something of a respite over this weekend. But for the time being, the unsettled theme continues. Low pressure firmly in control, like it has been through much of this week, bringing more blustery, showery weather to many places. We still have some strong winds across the south coast as we go through the end of the day and some heavy rain affecting eastern parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a blustery, showery theme across many parts, though the focus of 
of the rain pushing its way into more northern areas overnight with some clearer, drier weather for a time across some parts. Could allow for a touch of frost and a few fog patches to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, most places starting tomorrow on a relatively mild note. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday and there will be some further showery rain around, again, we could see some hail and some thunder mixed in with this, but we should also see some dry and perhaps even bright or sunny spells in between any heavier downpours. Temperatures will be a few degrees higher than today, highs of around 13, 14 Celsius, and the winds will be easing as we go through the day, so that should make it feel a touch more pleasant, perhaps. As we look towards Saturday, and yes, there will still be some showers around, but they don't look as intense, and they look a little bit fewer and further between compared to what we've seen over some recent days. So a greater chance of seeing some drier weather to come. And that's a similar picture for Sunday, but more unsettled weather arriving again by Monday. See you later. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was, and they're going to get even more money this time round, so why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter a massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5 pm on Friday. For another chance to win the voucher, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 double t UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's two o'clock on Thursday, the 28th of March. Lawless London. A manhunt is underway for a man who appeared to randomly stab people on a tube in South London, leaving two people fighting for their lives in hospital. Labour local election launch. We're going to hear from our political editor who has spent the day with Labour Party leader Kasirkia Starmer. He's been at the party as they launch their local election campaign and he's spoken to Sir Keir himself. 
And beware of German beer. Now ahead of Euros 2024, the Foreign Office warns football fans that German beer is stronger than the beer you can get in the UK. Well, will we be able to hack it? Will not you be able to hack it? We'll hear someone who is not only going to the Euros, but also loves beer. What will he make of it all? Now, throughout the programme, we've been asking for your views on what is a growing sense of lawlessness in our major cities, but perhaps most particularly in London. And it's interesting, we've been speaking uh, to Ray Addison throughout uh, the programme, who's been at the uh, Shortlands railway station, where uh, there was one of these incidents that occurred yesterday. And Heather wrote in to say... The train station where Ray Addison is reporting from is just a few hundred metres from the primary school I attended in the early 1970s. There was never anything like this incident when we lived near there. It was a gentle, peaceful place. So sad. Well, yeah, it's probably a story of many places in this country like that that used to be uh, less safe. Uh, Kelvin's got in touch. He thinks the root cause of most of these problems is drugs. He says they affect so many of us in society and the supply and distribution is at the root of this. Well, yes, when you look at gang violence, so much is mm. about drugs and territory to do with drugs. And how they're supplied and the people who supply them. Yeah, Absolutely. Paul says do a fantastic. the police do a fantastic job but are very vulnerable to too bad press. This should not be so, but it is. The police have to pick up all the failings of other services, such as social services, and they spend so much time dealing with those sorts of things rather than actually doing their job. I think that's very true. I mean, how many police officers have we heard complain about how they're acting as social care workers, how they're mm. acting as therapists sometimes, and how when they're there acting is as... danger. When, 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 like in that video that went viral of one of these stabbing incidents yesterday, mm. Everyone is sitting there, sort of frozen in their place. They don't quite know what to do. Our police officers are expected to run towards that sort of danger, and many, many of them do on a, a, a daily basis, almost. Uh, it is quite a remarkable thing, and I think perhaps we should maybe thank our police more often than we do. Yeah, and I do, I do, mm. but I do think there is a problem with some of them projecting weakness. I do mm. think that that is fair to say too. But should we get your headlines? Very good afternoon to you. It's three minutes past two. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. The Chancellor says he believes Thames Water is solvent despite shareholders withholding extra cash to keep it afloat. Half a billion pounds was to be injected before the end of this month. The share shareholders say the business plan is uninvestable. They want the regulator off what to increase customer bills by up to 40% over five years. It comes as rowers taking part in this weekend's boat race have been warned of high levels of E. coli uh, as a result of Thames Water dumping raw sewage. Now, the company serves nearly a quarter of the UK's population and has debts of more than £15 billion. Treasury will continue to monitor very carefully what's happening at Thames Water. Our understanding is that the company is still solvent and today's news should not have an impact on the services received by customers. Obviously, um, there are parts of the country where the service has not been up to scratch, including in my own constituency, and local MPs will continue to hold Thames Water to account in those situations. But overall, we will continue to watch the situation very carefully. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after an alleged stabbing on a London train yesterday afternoon. It happened between Shortlands and Beckenham just before four o'clock on a train bound for Victoria Station. Uh, footage shared on social media showed a masked man attacking another man with a large knife, while concerned passengers can be heard calling for help. The victim, in his 20s, remains in critical but stable condition in hospital. Sir Keir Starmer says Britain wants change and has vowed to revive levelling up for regions during Labour's local election campaign. Speaking at an event in the West Midlands, Sir Keir said he had hoped to be there to launch a general election campaign, but accused the Prime Minister of bottling it. He pledged a national renewal, promising to axe zero-hour contracts and give local mayors new powers to rejuvenate the high street. Stability with Labour or more chaos with the Tories? Unity or division? 
renewal or decline. A changed Labour Party ready to serve the interests of working people. Or a Conservative Party that has forgotten how to serve anything other than itself. Now, uh, Britain's leasehold property laws, plans to reform them, uh, have been criticised by peers who say the bill doesn't go far enough. Leaseholds are a form of ownership that allow homeowners to live in a property for a set o number of years while paying service charges. However, there's been mounting criticism of the system, uh, with many residents seeing their service charges rising dramatically often with little explanation. It means homeowners can be locked into costly contracts with little right to redress. The government uh, dropped its pledge to scrap leaseholds last year. Uh, Labour's housing spokesperson, Baroness Taylor, called the government's current proposal a shell of a bill that won't offer the security homeowners were promised. The Archbishop of Canterbury has called on people to pray this Easter weekend for the jailed journalist Evan Gershkovich. A Good Friday marks a year since the Wall Street Journal reporter was detained in Russia on charges of spying. No evidence has been presented for the allegations. He's the first US journalist to be arrested in Russia since the Cold War. Justin Welby says journalists around the world should be protected and free to hold those in power to account. Millions of people are being urged to send meter readings to their supplier to ensure they don't overpay. The average household energy bill is to fall to its lowest point in two years from next month as a result of Ofgem lowering its price cap. It will drop 12.3% from Monday, lowering average yearly bills from £1,900 to just under £1,700, an average saving of about £20 per month. And if you're planning on travelling this Easter weekend, well, you might want to set off early. The RAC is warning about long delays, uh, with journeys on some of the most popular routes taking twice as long. Uh, with the bank holiday weekend coinciding with the Easter holiday, some 14 million journeys are expected. And much of the congestion is thought to start this evening, so drivers told uh, it might be worth travelling outside peak times. A personal message from the King has been broadcast to Worcester Cathedral, marking the Royal Maundy service. The Queen was in attendance, as His Majesty told the service, Britain's blessed by services that exist for our welfare. He paid tribute to those organisations and their selfless staff and said we all benefit greatly from those who offer us friendship. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. The QR code's on your screen. And there's more information on our website. Now back to Tom and Emily. Good afternoon, Britain. It's eight minutes past two. And now yesterday in our capital city is being called a day of carnage in London as two separate major incidents took place across the city, leaving three victims fighting for their lives in hospital. A 19-year-old man has been arrested after he allegedly stabbed a man in broad daylight on a train in Beckenham. Just hours after this incident, police were called to Kennington Tube Station as two people were stabbed on the platform in a so-called senseless attack. And now a manhunt is underway. Now, it's worth saying that the cases don't appear to be linked to very separate incidents as it stands. Mm. But joining us now from Bromley is GB News reporter Ray Addison. Um, and I believe we also have GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White, who's in Kennington. Thank you very much indeed. Ray, we'll start with you. An arrest has been made. Have we heard any further updates? Well, we know that a knife has also been recovered. British Transport Police revealing that detail, but not saying whether it was in the possession of the 19-year-old uh, man who has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder, but a knife uh, nonetheless recovered. Of course, we know that around uh, 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon, police received those uh, emergency service alerts from the public stating that two men had been fighting as they entered a, a train at Shortland and then, of course, we saw that disturbing video on social media filmed by a passenger which showed that attack on the train as it was heading towards Victoria. 
Now, uh, one man was seen on that train wearing uh, black and uh, uh, wearing a face mask as well. Members of the public clearly disturbed and calling the emergency services. When the train got to Beckenham Junction, there was uh, a large uh, police presence eventually arrived and a man, we're now told in his 20s, was treated at the scene before being airlifted to a major trauma centre. Now, we're being told that he's in a critical but stable condition and specialist officers were told are also assisting his family at this time. British Transport Police with this latest statement saying they hope that this arrest will bring some reassurance to those who use the rail network. I have to say I've been speaking to a lot of passengers here, regular commuters, people who live here in Bromley and they're saying that this area has changed significantly after the last couple of years. They're very concerned to let their, uh, their children, their youngsters get on the rail network. Part of that they're putting down to the fact that there isn't any kind of um, uh, ticket barriers here at the station. There never has been and there's a theory from one man that I spoke to that that could be an encouragement to those who wish to commit crime in this area. They know that they can come and go without having um, that barrier in place uh, to stop them getting through without a ticket. Now, um, Police patrols have been increased, we're told, across the, the local stations in, in this neighbouring area. However, I've been here since 6.30 this morning. I've not seen a single police patrol so far. And I found out earlier on today as well, there's a British Transport Police office here at the station um, on platform, between platforms three and four. However, you wouldn't know it. There's no signage. I've seen no officers from British uh, Transport Police uh, at all. And I would wonder how many people here who use this station every day would actually be aware uh, of, the, of, the, of the fact that there is that police presence or supposedly that police presence here uh, at the station. So police obviously have made this arrest now. A 19-year-old man uh, remains in custody. I haven't seen a single police officer despite this incident. That's quite shocking. Mm. Well, I mean, perhaps there have been all hands on deck on this manhunt. It does seem that there has been at least one suspect um, arrested in that case. But, um, Ray, thank you for that. Shall we cross across to Kennington, where, of course, an active manhunt is still underway? Mark White, uh, what's the very latest there? Well, I can tell you there are British transport police officers here at Kennington tube station, uh, both on the outside and inside the tube station as that investigation continues. The incident itself unfolded at 10.30 last night on the northbound platform at Kennington tube station when a man was stabbed, another man, a commuter on the platform, tried to intervene bravely to try to help this man who was being stabbed. And he himself then was attacked by an individual who fled the scene, we're told, by the uh, Metropolitan Police and British Transport Police. This individual uh, has not been traced so far. Now, we haven't had any kind of description released by the Metropolitan Police, the British Transport Police, no pictures either of the individual that they're looking for. Now, that might indicate that they are confident uh, of a line of inquiry that might take them to a suspect and they don't yet need the public's help. But no description, no pictures released as yet about this individual. Um, we're told that the two victims, well, the police believe anyway, that they didn't know their attacker. Well, let's hope the suspect is found and apprehended sooner rather than later. Thank you very much indeed, Mark White there from Kennington and, of course, Ray Addison, who is in Bromley. Thank you very much indeed. Well, should we get some context in the general uh, atmosphere of crime now in the capital. The former Metropolitan Police Officer Graham Wetton joins us now. And Graham, do you get the sense that there is this, this growing crime problem, this growing violent crime problem in our capital city? Good afternoon. Um, I think it's, it's documented that there's an increase in, in violent crime, increase in knife crime. They're both priorities along with many other things for policing across the capital. So, yeah, there is a sense of these violent crimes, these knife crimes as well, are increasing across the capital. It's something the police are aware of and working to try and combat this.
think it's happening? Sorry, you broke up there. Graham, why do you think it's happening? Why do you think we're seeing what appears to be an increase in these types of brazen attacks? I mean, one in broad daylight mm -hmm. on a train with commuters just sitting there, another on a platform at a major train station. I mean, presumably there were people around. I mean, these yeah. aren't... Uh, no one's trying to hide anything anymore, it seems. No, and again, with 24-7 news, we're getting to hear about these things a lot quicker than we used to. So there were instances, instances before of, of violent crime and knife crime, but why it's happening is a number of reasons. Uh, they're not really scared of any sort of like deterrent. There's no, no fear about being caught, um, no fear about the punishment they're likely to get if they are caught, if they are convicted. So I think there's a number of factors there as to why we're seeing this. You mentioned, I think, in an intro earlier on about, um, or someone mentioned drugs, etc. There's a number of factors why these crimes take place. It can be literally um, just someone disrespecting somebody, so the, an attack or violent crime takes place, or it can be over a dispute over an area of ground around drugs, etc. So there's a number of yeah. factors. It's all speculation, but at, at the moment, that will be part of the inquiries that the investigation team will be looking at the motive for the for both these attacks. And it does seem, unfortunately, that disproportionate, disproportionately it is young black men in the capital who are carrying knives. Um, why is that? Do we know? No, I think it's just, again, it comes down to um, maybe, again, it comes down to socioeconomic reasons. You know, the, 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 we've heard this before, uh, how they're brought up, the, the lack of opportunity, the lack of employment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they get drawn into a life of crime, um, criminal activity, and that leads them on to violent crime, which leads them then possibly on to knife crime. So number of factors, but for policing, it's challenging to deal with these because, as we saw yesterday, they can happen literally from one end of the capital to the other. I just find it very hard to believe that there's a lack of employment. Anywhere you go, you see uh, pubs and all the like sort of advertising for more staff. There are a million job vacancies mm. in the United Kingdom. Uh, we've got a very low rate of unemployment. I mean, can we really blame the sort of socio-economic factors on this? I think it's a factor, but I think when you speak to young people, it's almost the job that they want isn't out there. There's the, the job, there are jobs out there, but they're at a very low level, very low paid. And dare I say it, with some, some of the criminal activities, there's possibly the potential to earn, mon earn more money by going into a life of crime. And that's what you're combating here. It's, it's almost like, you know, which route are they going to take? But for policing, it's a real challenge and one of many priorities that they face. And, Graham... <sighs> It's a difficult question because I don't want to be seen to bash the police because I respect the job they do. No. It's a dangerous job that not many of us could do. But <sighs> has the quality sometimes gone down, or at least the priorita priorities? I think the I think when you're looking at and it is well documented, policing has a problem with recruitment at the moment. There's not enough people wanting to come into policing. So it's, it's, it's common sense, really. If you've got less people applying and you have to take a certain number to keep your numbers up, then possibly the quality coming in isn't, isn't as it was. The training isn't the same as it was. And more importantly, and this goes across the board, regardless of those two factors, the experience on the front line isn't there anymore. It's the experience on the front line. You, you can look at quality of, of officers at the moment. And, they, and I taught recruits for seven years. I had some really high quality recruits who I kept in touch with, when I actually got out on the street, within about a year or two, they were the most experienced person on their team. So mm. it's a retention issue in policing mm. that's key. You need experienced people on the teams to train the new people coming in. You can't gain quality without having experience there to teach you what that quality is it's and what it looks like. It's a bit of a worry, like. isn't it? If, you've, if, you've, if you're a police officer for two years and mm. you, you, don't, you don't quite like it and just decide to... Uh, it's not for you. But, but, but more so, we hear politicians all the time talk about numbers. Mm. Numbers, numbers, mm. numbers. 20,000 here, whatever other number we're talking about. And not every number is the same. Uh, if, if someone is leaving the force with a decade of experience, yeah. they are going to be a much bigger loss than Absolutely. perhaps Perhaps it will take many more to make up for the work and the experience and the knowledge that that person yeah. leaving had. That's a great point, and it's one I've mentioned on many interviews. This 20,000 figure, we keep hearing numerous politicians um, quote saying that they've recruited 20,000 more. They've lost almost that much, but they've lost it in experience with 15, 20 year, 25 year experienced officers being replaced with one or two year service officers. You can't replace, you can't buy experience, you can't replace experience. 
It's retention that's the big issue, mm. but then recruitment is now becoming an even greater issue because they can't get the numbers in to replace those people leaving. We need the experienced ones to stick around a little longer. Maybe that does mean more pay. Well, it's a really important point, and Graham, thank you so much for joining us and talking us through it. I mean, it's it's an angle that I think we don't touch upon enough. You know, you just say, oh, 20,000 in, 20,000 out, that's the same. It's not the same. These are different people, people different levels of experience. In different... terms of experience. Yeah, we're and... not all equal. Uh, it's a controversial thing to say. We're but, equal, uh... of course, no. Equal but different. Uh, don't use that phrase. That's, Why not? Uh, that's very separate but equal vibes. That's not. Anyway, the Foreign Office issue a warning to football fans ahead of the Euros. Get this they've told us, they've warned us that German beer is far more strong than uh, our UK beer. Mm. Um, is this a problem? Should there be a warning? Should German beer and English beer be equal? Uh, <laughs> it's a question, and more on that very soon. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. Has the NHS killed your relative and then lied to you about it? There is an alleged cover-up culture in the NHS. They lie to you about why your loved one died, about poor care, then bury documents with evidence in them, and they try to silence staff who speak out. This is according to the NHS Ombudsman. There are around 11,000 avoidable deaths every year. 11,000! Someone's mum dies, their children know something dodgy happened, and then they're met with a rotten culture, including the altering of care plans, the disappearance of crucial documents, and complete denials. They lie to you, but they really get away with it because the NHS is like a religion, and people dare not criticise it. You'd be accused of NHSophobia. The annual budget is around £180 billion, and we now have about 2 million people working for the NHS. They cannot keep blaming everything, on being underfunded and understaffed. If they're covering up medical negligence, it means the problem doesn't get dealt with and it keeps happening. And that is the fault of the NHS managers, the people who run it. They've got the money for 837 non-clinical staff working at English hospitals on the highest paid band nine contracts, which is between 99,000 and 115,000 pounds a year. How many nurses would that pay for? How many junior doctors? And they've got the time on their hands to think about making the NHS the world's first carbon-neutral health service. They've got time to consider whether women in labour should be picked up by an electric ambulance that might have to be recharged en route to the hospital. There are NHS managers with a budget of £180 billion, 2 million members of staff, and they're crying about being understaffed and under-resourced. If they spent more time looking after patients instead of finding ways to cover up avoidable deaths, then maybe we'd have a better health service. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. 24 minutes past two, and it's a penalty for German beer. Yes, because the Foreign Office has issued a warning to English football fans. I think only English football fans travelling mm. to the Euros in Germany this summer because, get this, German beer apparently packs more of a punch than a British brew. 
Yes, fans are being told to drink responsibly <laughs> as drunk fans risk being barred from stadiums. But is this nanny state overkill and is German beer really all that. Well, and can an us... Englishman be a trusted with German beer? Well, big questions, big questions all. Joining us now is English football fan Tom Thompson. He's going to the Euros and, we're told, loves a beer. <laughs> Tom, were you surprised by the Foreign Office of all places issuing this advice? <laughs> oh, it's, it's hilarious, really. I mean, I don't know any football fan on the planet that will be taking that in any way seriously at all. I mean, could you imagine being in a bar with all of your friends and you're you're at the bar it's your round and you're just like sorry guys i need to hold up here the foreign office have said this stuff makes me feel a bit silly so it's our quarters all round. i think it's absolutely nuts so yeah we i don't think anyone will be uh paying too much attention to that for sure although some english football fans do let us down sometimes don't they when they're abroad um they can behave in um well, they make a disgrace of themselves at times. Is, could this warning, you know, give them second thoughts? Ha, uh, no, probably not. I reckon, yeah, like you say, 99% of people there have a great time. Wherever they're from, it's not just England fans, it's fans, you know, other countries have, you know, issues as well. I know England fans have a, a reputation, but end of the day, if you are one of those people who are going out to cause an issue, then I'm fairly sure the, uh, the Foreign Office isn't going to make an impact on that whatsoever. No, this Probably is just, not. It's just about the first time that I'm hearing that a German beer is apparently more alcoholic than British beer. I'm someone who enjoys a German beer hall, but it, I mean, I, I didn't realise that it was so much, so much more alcoholic. Well, we went out to uh, Munich in January, and I, I mean, I love the the beer over there. It feel it, it just feels better, to be honest. It, it may be a little bit stronger, but I'm, again, pretty sure you know pretty quickly if uh, if it's starting to have an impact on you. But, I mean, you know, thinking over last weekend, we're in the, in the pub and there are some terrible beers in there. Like, you know, you can't, I know it's not English beer, but Carlsberg's and all the rest of it there. Other all, brands all are big. available. Yeah, I just exactly. wonder what the... I wonder what the thought process here is. It just um, killjoy civil servants. I mean, have they had a warning from the FA or from the uh, the German Foreign Office that they need to do something about this? I wonder how it happened. Oh, I think I know what it must be. It's so that when inevitably some English football fans misbehave, the Foreign Office will, have, will be able to go. Not our fault. We told you this. Exactly right. Yes, yeah, tick box exercise. That's all it is. Uh, and like I say. You know, no one's listening to those fun bungees over there just trying to, you know, navigate what people are doing. So I certainly won't be paying any attention. Well, I hope you have a wonderful time at the Euros and be careful with that German beer. <laughs> I've heard I've heard it's stronger than British beer. It's absent, so clearly. You go. It's... Uh, so be careful with it. And there's always Prosecco <laughs> if you fancy something a little more, uh, a, a little different. Oh, anyway, yeah. thank you very much, Tom Thompson, English football fan and beer lover. Great. Yes. Um, oh, well, there you go. For, I mean, I, I thought the biggest issue with you know, drinking in, in sort of German beer halls isn't the, the, the strength of the beer. It's the fact that they don't give you pint glasses. They give you steins of the thing, these enormous glass tankards uh, where, where, frankly, you don't know how many pints you've had because you don't know how many pints to a stein and how many... I mean, it's, it's well, Paul's counting just, is not, not helpful. Paul's just written in and he says, some English beers are like washing up water. A good can is Carpacci, 9% from Poland, 9%? which is widely available. 9%, that's like a wine, isn't it? <laughs> A cheap wine. And Paul says that's it. Target the England fans regarding the German beer. I find that comment racist and discriminatory. <laughs> well, there you go. Oh, I think I think xenophobic is the word you're looking for more than uh, racist. After all, the Anglo-Saxons did come from Saxony. <laughs> I'll take that, Paul. <laughs> Tom's told you there. Uh, but yes, it is. It's always the English football yeah. fans that get a bad rap, isn't it? Well, maybe, maybe we need to start strengthening up our beer a bit. I know that the government brought in new taxes uh, last year or the year before at the budget that said that our oh, alcoholic drinks are going to be taxed as a proportion of the alcohol. So yeah. if they're more alcoholic, there's more tax, and less alcoholic, less tax. Is this some perverse market meddling from so the government trying so to make our beer weaker? So your absinthe would... Uh cost a lot of tax. Yes. And your uh, and, and to be fair, I understand, I understand the logic, right? We, uh, it was getting rid of the old EU system yeah. where the taxes just made no sense at all. There was no rhyme nor reason, uh, depending on what, what sort of thing, where it was 
brewed or whatever, that would be the different yeah. level of tax. At least it's simple now. Low alcohol, low tax, high alcohol, high tax. Although some might argue you might want it the other way around. Well, there you go. But coming up, we're going to hear from our political editor. We've been waiting to speak to uh, Christopher Ho because he's been uh, with the Labour Party leader, Sir Keir Starmer. I wonder what he's had to say. What has Christopher asked him? And is he convinced? That's after your headlines with Aaron. Hi there, it's exactly half past two. I'm Aaron Armstrong. Thames Water shareholders have said its business plan is uninvestable and they won't put in half a billion pounds to fund it. Shareholders wanted the regulator off what to allow a 40% bill hike over five years for customers and more lenient penalties for falling foul of regulations. The extra cash was to be put in by the end of this month. It comes as rowers taking part in this weekend's boat race have been warned about high levels of E. coli in the River Thames as a result of the company dumping raw sewage. A 19-year-old man's been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after a stabbing on a train in London yesterday afternoon. It happened just before four o'clock between Shortlands and Beckenham on a train bound for Victoria Station. A footage shared on social media showed a masked man attacking another man with a large knife. While concerned passengers looked on, they can be heard calling for help. The victim remains in critical but stable condition in hospital. Millions of people are being urged to send meter readings to their energy supplier to ensure they don't overpay. The average household bill will fall to its lowest point in two years from next month after Ofgem lowered its price cap. It will drop 12.3% from Monday, uh, bringing those average yearly bills down from £1,900 to just under £1,700, a saving of about £20 each month. And King Charles has reaffirmed his coronation pledge not to be served, but to serve in a personal Easter message. His pre-recorded comments were broadcast at the Royal Monday service at Worcester Cathedral. The King has stepped back from royal duties while he's being treated for cancer, but the Queen attended in his absence. And you can sign up to our alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Hello, very good day to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Another unsettled day ahead with some heavy rain and some strong winds too because we are still under the influence of low pressure like we have been through much of this week. So a blustery and showery theme for many of us. The strongest winds today will be across the south coast. The heaviest rain likely to be across eastern parts of Northern Ireland. We do have a couple of warnings out. The showery rain as it pushes its way northwards across much of England and Wales brings the risk of some hail and some thunder. Meanwhile, across parts of Scotland, we could see some sleet and snow over the higher ground. Temperatures will be around or a little bit below average for the time of year, but feeling noticeably colder in those strong winds. More showery rain to come as we go through this evening, all of it pushing its way northwards. And there will be something a little bit drier and perhaps clearer for a time developing as we go through the early hours of Good Friday. Could allow for touch of frost and a few patches of fog to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. But most places are going to hold up a few degrees above freezing. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday, and again, it is going to be a blustery start and some showers developing as we go through the day. Some of them could once more be heavy with some further hail and thunder mixed in, but there should be some drier or perhaps even brighter spells in between the showers. And temperatures are actually going to be up a few degrees compared to today. And with that, the winds will be easing too, so it should feel a little more pleasant. Bye bye. The latest GB News travel. Good afternoon, I'm Jules Buckley. Problems in County Durham in Bishop Auckland this afternoon. Rotary Way, the A688, is blocked both ways between the Tyndale Crossing roundabout and the Aldi roundabout and queuing at the scene of a collision. The clockwise M25 is currently part blocked just after South Mims at 23. There's queues at the scene of an accident. The earlier one for the A358 in Somerset between Ash Hill and Ilminster is still causing delays, all linked back open but still slow going. And then the A30 in in Somerset in West Coker. Now that's closed between Gooseacre Lane and the Bumford Hollow roundabout for flooding. That's causing queues. And the A30 in Devon on the eastbound side from the Woodley Junction towards Fingal Glen. That remains closed and queuing. That's at the scene there of a serious collision. It's lunchtime. And for now, that's your latest. 
You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 2.35, you're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, the Tory era of politics as a performance art is coming to an end, said Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer this morning during his speech in Dudley as Labour launched their local election campaign. Well, this comes as Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner is once again under the fire, under fire because police are reassessing claims that Angela Rayner broke electoral law in the early 2010s when she lived between two council houses in Stockton. This all relates to selling tax. one of those houses and not paying capital gains tax upon that sale. That's the allegation. Yeah, so the police are reassessing whether they were wrong to not investigate uh, this. So we'll find out more. But joining us now is our political editor, Christopher Hope, who has been with Sir Keir Starmer all day. Lucky you, Christopher Hope. Uh, Christopher, tell us, were many questions um, asked about the whole Angela Rayner tax affair, council house? Yeah, hi Tom, hi Emily. Yeah, they were asked here in Dudley. Uh, Angela Rayner was in the front row of the speech that Keir Starmer gave. It was to launch the party's um, May the second local election uh, campaign. But, but the questions amongst the journalists soon turned to Angela Rayner. Of course, she's been on the broadcasting rounds today, uh, making clear that she feels she's done nothing wrong, has taken legal advice tax advice on whether she owns two things on the sale of this property um, in Greater Manchester in 2015. Any um, capital gains tax, was that owed? Because was she living in that property or a different one? And indeed, was there any, uh, with the electoral um, uh, register, was, was that OK? Was that all up to speed? Um, was she in the right house? And Greater Manchester Police are looking again whether there's been any illegality. For Sir Keir Starmer, he's made very clear that he believes Angela Ray and he says he's got her full, his full confidence in her and his full support. Um, but quite interestingly, he, he says that he hasn't looked at nor asked to look at the legal advice um, given to Angela Ray to say there's been nothing wrong here. And you might wonder why a top QC, um, a former director of public prosecutions, hasn't asked to look uh, at the legal advice Given to Angela Rayner, making clear she's done nothing wrong. Well, we don't know yet, but as things stand, this legal advice, the tax advice, is not going to be published. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer was, was asked that in the question and answer session after the speech. He said he wouldn't expect um, anyone else to publish that kind of information in public life, so why should Angela Rayner be any different? Um, and certainly the cr crowd um, behind us journalists in that speech were on the side. Of Angela Rayner. It was quite an interesting speech, Tom and Emily, just on a wider point. He said that, that um, it's the, the time for no more political hero complexes is over. I asked him for GB News why is it then that uh, Rachel Reeves, David Lammy praised Margaret Thatcher, and indeed Sir Keir Starmer is almost supporting and praising a bit of Boris Johnson's ideas on levelling up, although he, he disputes the way it's been carried out. Um, but the Labour's idea is this new uh, Take Back Control Act, of course. Um, he made clear he was supporting uh, these Tories because he, th he likes the idea of single-minded purpose um, and he wants to copy that, certainly in the case of Margaret Thatcher. And with levelling up, he thinks it's a good idea, badly executed. It's interesting, Chris, because he's chosen Dudley to launch this local election campaign and to say that, you know, levelling up was a promise that was never fulfilled, that it was just political words that wasn't followed through. But Dudley is getting a £24 million bus and tram station revamp. An £18 million leisure centre has been built in the last two years. £80 million has gone into Dudley Town Centre for the whole regeneration. There's a very light rail research centre recently opened in the town and a 38,000 square foot ice rink as part of all of this levelling up. 
regeneration. It's hard to think of a place that perhaps has had more intensity in terms of all of its levelling up funding. Is this a, a misstep from Sir Keir Starmer? I don't think so. Certainly the announcements are there, but if you talk to local journalists in this area, they think that the money hasn't come through yet. And we saw that in Darlington when Rishi Sunak went there to, with, for the, for the P, G, GB News' People's Panel. The big question, the big gripe in Darlington was they keep applying for levelling up money and very little, if at nothing at that point, had got to them. So Keir Starmer made the point that 90% of levelling up money hasn't been handed out yet. So there appears to be a problem with the announcements you're describing, of course, but the plumbing, the wiring to get that money into these communities isn't working. And this is the document which they've given out here um, by the Labour Party. They, they are trying to re-own, take back control, to use their language, a new Take Back Control Act, um, almost adopting the language of Brexit and trying to understand why people voted to leave in 2016 in such numbers. Uh, that's an idea which Sir Keir Starmer spent some time getting to understand and to know, and that's why I think he's in someone like Dudley. Yes, there's big announcements, Tom, of course you're right on that, but it's not being seen on the ground here, mm -hmm. and that's why I think Labour thinks they can improve what is a, they think is a good idea badly executed. Yes, in fact, with that £24 million bus and tram station revamp, turning it into a really rather superb-looking, uh, splendid structure, yeah. well, in order to do that, it's currently closed. So all Dudley has got right now is a closed <laughs> bus station. And, of well, course, in a couple of years' time, it will look amazing. Right, I mean... But the short-term electoral impact of some of these projects, ironically, could be negative. That's right. I, I, and I should say, while we're in Dudley, it could also be they had been expecting Labour to maybe launching their general election campaign today, because, of course, it would have been, had to be called by, by Mr Sunak on the 26th, two days ago, to have an election on May the 2nd. So it may have been they'd booked this venue in Dudley in expectation of launching either a local election campaign or the big one, the general election campaign. As it is, we move forward, maybe in June or more likely in October, November. Surely Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner can't wriggle out of this scrutiny over the tax and this council home. I mean, um, I mean Angela Rayner is very much on record calling for tax affairs of other opposition MPs to her, Conservative MPs, uh, calling for their tax affairs to be made yeah. public because she suspects and others have suspected that things weren't done by the book. So why on earth should it be different when it comes to Angela Rayner? If she's done nothing wrong, why not just, you know... Be transparent. Well, Sir Keir Starmer is making very clear he takes at face value um, the denials from Angela Rayner. There has been some expert, expert evidence put forward. He has not asked to see that. He's allowed his advisers to see that. He hasn't seen it himself. And I should say that Sir Keir Starmer has allowed himself to be interviewed by me for GB News. Um, and, in fact, I can say I did go into some detail on those questions, mm. but I can't reveal what was said until 3pm today. Well, so do keep watching GB News on Mark, Martin Daubney's uh, show. Yes, that'll be very interesting to see what he says. Uh, I'm sure you, you press him on that. Uh, because, you know, the story keeps coming up and then sort of tempering out, doesn't mm. it? And, and it's then, interesting. Then back I again. think a lot of people sometimes feel that were this a question asked of a government minister, mm. there'd be so much more pressure on it. But because it's an opposition minister, even though this is an opposition that everyone thinks is going to be in government in six months' time, uh, it just has less bite. But, Christopher Hope, we look forward to your interview I, 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 at... Three... Oh, sorry, yes, do go on. Well, I was going to say, I mean, it, 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 the journalists repeatedly ask questions in the press conference of this, and, again, and others have been pressing after that about the issue of Angela Rayner's uh, affairs. And I think, you know, we are trying to get to the bottom of it for viewers. I think, as you say, as we go towards the election, the scrutiny on these rather unknown members of the Shadow Cabinet compared to the actual Cabinet will grow and grow. Mm. Mm, yes, thank you very much indeed, Christopher Hope, our political editor there in Dudley. Yes, I guess it's about it's... the principle, isn't it? Need to know if there was some wrongdoing there, mm. regardless of the amount of money in, in particular. Well, just 16 minutes' time until we see that interview, that yes. sit-down interview with Sir Keir Starmer. Chris Hope says he's uh, held Sir Keir Starmer's feet to the fire, has grilled him, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. But coming up... Children's books, including classics like Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland, are coming with trigger warnings, with cautions that they contain messages of white supremacy. What's this about? More after this.
Hughes and Co. Weekdays from 6 p.m. This story caught my eye. Lloyds Bank, right? They own the insurance company Scottish Widows. They have now um, issued some kind of suggested guidance about which word to try and avoid, to try and avoid upsetting people or perhaps be as inclusive as possibly can be. One of these words is widows, which really caught my eye because of the amount of stupidity. If you own a brand literally called Scottish Widows, you can't then be saying that the word widows is triggering and offensive. Anyway, because it is so ludicrous, I need to move over from that part <laughs> because I want to talk about the broader issue. So yeah. many organisations, they have what they call ESG. I'm going to bring a graphic up on the screen uh, in case you're not familiar with what this is. But it's a sense of kind of government, and I would say it's almost like a spine. It underpins so much of what business does today. It stands for environmental, social and governance. And it's around things like um, how does a business perform when it comes to their environmental uh, impact, how diverse are their employees, how diverse is their board, and so on and so forth. Do you think ESG is a force for good and much needed within business or not, Ben? It is the introduction of systemic institutionalised prejudice in the United Kingdom, which is going to damage dreadfully our economy, but also our culture, our cohesion as a society, and it's undermining, again, coming back to it, the nation state that is the United Kingdom. ESG has to be ditched. Mm, strong words, Judita. Do you agree with him? I don't agree because I think that with ESG, when you have them, what you're having an increase in is specialists in ESG being introduced into companies to, in, to kind of imbricate it into how the company functions. If you're moving in a direction of making your, com your company's functionality be optimised in a way that is inclusive of anyone from any background who has the qualifications to occupy that position, that is a good thing. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. crack on to the bizarre story about trigger warnings yes. on Alice in Wonderland. Let's get some of your views at home on the television. <laughs> Should we talk about... Views on the television. People think that it's a technology that's gone too far. Uh, views on the television. Such a smarty pants. They think, they think smart... there used to be... Uh, television used to be better when there were only four channels. No, completely disagree with that. Um, no, there have been people writing in about the German beer discussion that we have had. Um, and Jean has said that German beers are likely between 4.5 and 5.4%, whereas an English ale can be 6%. So I don't know where the Foreign Office are getting their whole sort of scare story. I don't know about from. that because someone else emailed in and, and the name, uh, I've forgotten, forgotten your name, so sorry, but you emailed in saying 19%. 19%. It's common in Germany. I, I refuse to believe That's stronger that you can than a walk strong into a Munich beer hall and <laughs> do pour your stein of, of whatever they have on tap on house. And I refuse to believe that will be 19%. Graham says, look on the bright side. If German beer is stronger, it will take less to re reach the same effect. So surely an economic bonus. Yes, but what are you going to do in your spare time if you've got hours? Drink more slowly. Drink some water, drink slowly, nurse drink a, a lukewarm beer. I don't think so. Maybe alternate with a zero alcohol beer and there a German go. beer. There you go. There are always non-alcoholic beers available. Yeah. Although uh, Gary says most German beers are 5% plus. Uh, the brewing uses natural ingredients and do not contain chemical ingredients. Come on, Gary. Chemicals are natural. Also, Have Russ... you ever seen how many E numbers are in a banana? Genuinely, genuinely. Because an E number is just how you denote sugar. You look at the E numbers in a peach or a banana or an apple, it's full of them. So 
So let's not say chemicals. Tom's fun at parties, can't you tell? <laughs> um, and uh, Ross has got in touch because he's got a bone to pick with us Well, and our headlines, which we aren't always responsible for. Oh. He says, just seen your headline and I'd like to point out that the EU does not do pints. When did we say pints? It must have be been on our I've headline. been saying steins. Oh. And I hope I've been pronouncing it correctly. Oh. Das ist gut, to be not? fair, Russ has said lots of love, so I don't think he's too oh, upset about bless. it. So I don't think, no. no, but um, there have been more serious issues as well. We've been talking about the lawless state of our capital city, and Margaret uh, has written in to say, following the train attack in Bromley, it appears it's not just nightclubs having metal detectors. I think there's a call for lots of other places having them too. Yes, but it'd be sad if you had to introduce turnstiles and barriers um, because uh, because of crime. Is that the society we want to be in, surely? But we want to squeeze in one more story yes. before the end of the show because children's stories like Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland now come with a trigger warning at universities. Universities, alerting readers to possible themes of white supremacy. Yes, quote, these unquote. warnings are being applied to... Quo, what, colonial narratives, that's, that's the claim, commonly found in adventure stories and famous novels from the uh, Victorian era. Well, joining us now is the actor Charlie Lawson. And, and Charlie, um, these warnings have been applied to Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland. I, uh, what's, what's this university getting at? Well, look, first of all, this isn't um, this is nothing new. Um, uh, we hadn't heard about it for a while. Universities have been doing this over the last couple of years. I remember having a chat with one of your colleagues about it uh, with Oxford University. But when Gabriella, the lovely Gabby, phoned me up today, I, I had to beg her to put me on after nine o'clock because I, I found myself <laughs> getting rather irate about the whole thing. But I will do my best to be very polite. Uh, yes, keep it clean. Dead. Yes, look, which is quite difficult for me, as you'll appreciate over this subject. Look, this is universities just jumping on the same, you know, trying to be relative, relevant bandwagon. Uh, you know, is it any wonder that um, you, we look at the quality of um, graduates from university, and, and in my humble opinion, um, some of them are slightly disappointing. But I did phone a couple of people I knew who had sons and daughters at various leading universities, and they had been speaking this morning. And thank the Lord, they think it's a complete load of bloody nonsense, as I do. Uh, I mean, I believe C.S. Lewis is on this list. Is that correct, girls and That's boys? That's right. Right. Well, listen, let me suggest to these namby pammy plonkers, shall we say, at, at York, St. John's York University, I suggest... You give up the C give her give the CS Lewis Center a ring in East Belfast because that's where your man came from. And I think you'll find you'll get short shrift because we're not all about that in East Belfast. We don't censor anything. See, Charlie, so I think these I think these universities think and these university students and the professors think they're being oh so clever by finding these yeah. narratives and putting these trigger warnings. But you actually think people are getting uh, are actually not as intelligent as they think they are, and actually they're just... No, uh... and they, they all want to join Just Stop Oil, all these people in Extinction Rebellion. In fact, they all march on Saturdays probably as well. But listen, it's to be expected. We're used to it now. I mean, if you want to... I digress slightly, but I mean, you look at... We've been talking today on the programme about the quality of policing and graduates being taken into the police as opposed to long-term residential training. And the standards I think you'll find of our policing, especially in the metro in the in the metropolitan police, has gone down the bloody tubes. And we can see it every day on the on the of whatever it is, GB News or any other news program you choose to watch. And that's a symptom of the same crappy nonsense that's coming out of universities. And uh, you know. Shakespeare will be next, don't you worry. Well, there you go. Head. You've managed to respond to two of our main stories today in one. So thank you so much. We're going to have to leave it there because we've come to the end of the show. Uh, but thank you very much indeed, Charlie Lawson, actor, of course. Good stuff. Well, I think Shakespeare does need lots of trigger warnings. You know, it talks about daggers. There's um, uh, uh, lots, of, lots of sort of... Um, Talking about people who come from sort of Moorish lands. Well, apparently, it's all about it. white men and therefore is uh, the worst thing ever. Um, but let's go to Martin because that's the end of our show. That's it for today. Martin Dobney. Martin, what is coming up on your show? 
Well, whatever that fella was drinking, I'd like a pint of it. But on my show today, Sakir Starmer sits down with GB News and we ask him, what would he do about the Batley grammar school teacher knife crime? Why an anti-knife crime campaign from Nigeria tells us black youths need tough love, not youth clubs. And how we met the world's stupidest students. Well, we got them to sign a pro hootie petition. That's all coming after your weather forecast. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather forecast brought to you by the Met Office. If you're hoping for something a little bit drier, then there is something of a respite over this weekend. But for the time being, the unsettled theme continues. Low pressure firmly in control, like it has been through much of this week, bringing more blustery, showery weather to many places. We still have some strong winds across the south coast as we go through the end of the day and some heavy rain affecting eastern parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, it's a blustery, showery theme across many parts, though the focus of the rain pushing its way into more northern areas overnight with some clearer, drier weather for a time across some parts. Could allow for a touch of frost and a few fog patches to develop, particularly across parts of Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, most places starting tomorrow on a relatively mild note. Otherwise, as we go through Good Friday and there will be some further showery rain around, again, we could see some hail and some thunder mixed in with this, but we should also see some dry and perhaps even bright or sunny spells in between any heavier downpours. Temperatures will be a few degrees higher than today, highs of around 13, 14 Celsius, and the winds will be easing as we go through the day, so that should make it feel a touch more pleasant, perhaps. As we look towards Saturday, and yes, there will still be some showers around, but they don't look as intense, and they look a little bit fewer and further between compared to what we've seen over some recent days. So a greater chance of seeing some drier weather to come. And that's a similar picture for Sunday, but more unsettled weather arriving again by Monday. See you later. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News.